We'll call our meeting to order. Schlotz Select Board, Tuesday, November 13th, 2018. Lots of visitors, welcome. Um, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Nope. The first thing we're going to do is we've had our annual audit for the fiscal year that ended July 31st. Rick Brigham is here from Sullivan Powers and he's going to kind of give us a highlight and feedback from the results of the audit. So welcome and well, thanks for having me. Um, we can go about this a couple of different ways. Does everybody have, uh, I want to make sure we all have the same documents in front of us. Does everybody have a draft copy of the audit report with them? I did 30 seconds ago, yes. All right. So what I'd like to do is just kind of skip through the audit report, give you the highs and lows of that, and we'll get, we'll go from that right into our audit committee letter, which is a letter that I think Dean passed out to you, which is just a required communication from, uh, from me as your auditor to the board saying specific things and we have to do that in every audit so i'll go over that real briefly at the end um but let's just go ahead and dive right into the report so one of the important parts about and i always try to stress this is when you're looking at the audit report and your draft may or may not have it in it but um with the final audit report comes something called an mdna a management discussion and analysis it's a great document user friendly that describes and explains what happened during the fiscal year in layman's terms. Makes, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff in the audit report can get complicated and can, can bog people down. But what I try to let them know is you can find in a few pages of that document a real good written uh, explanation of what happened during the year in terms that are much easier to understand. And uh, there is a copy on the table. And that, that document will be bound right into the audit report as, uh, you know, the first few pages right after the opinion in the final document. What we're doing tonight is we're just reviewing the drafts, getting, you know, making sure any questions are answered. And then from then we will uh, finish up our drafts, do our final ad checks and get, get you final, uh, final audit reports fairly quickly. Looking over the, uh, if we go to page one of the audit, there's... Pages one through three, that's my job right here. These three pages. It's the audit opinion. You have three, ch three choices in an audit opinion. You can have what's called an adverse opinion, meaning your financial statements aren't fairly stated. You can have a qualified opinion, which means except for these things, which there could be two or three or one exception, there everything's fairly stated. Or you can have a clean opinion, which means there is no adjust no modifications to the opinion and that the financial statements are fairly stated based on our audit. And once again, you guys have achieved an unqualified audit report. Um, and I always, you know, I always try to reiterate to people, not, a lot of, not all towns get that. It's an important, it's an important uh, goal to try to get to. And I know over the last few years since I've been here, we, we started this process, and I feel like we've really hit a transition where <clears throat> we have really good communication happening with Dean, Mary, the board, the auditors, and I feel like we have a real good group that asks good questions and ultimately will lead to this clean audit report. So everybody is a part of this process and I want to congratulate you all for that. Um, looking through the... If we go to page nine, basically this is the... Uh, this is a balance sheet as, uh, as of June 30th. It's a snapshot in time on June 30th of what your assets and your, your liabilities for the town look like. Again, this, the way this, we have two kinds of financial statements. This is called our government-wide, which includes everything. It includes your fixed assets. It includes your debt. It includes all your cash, all your liabilities. This, this document, when you look at this, like I said, this is more like the balance sheet and the next couple pages are the income statement of the whole town as a whole. And it basically treats it just like your business would treat it, booking the fixed assets and booking the debt. A lot of, when, when you're looking at most of the governmental, uh, the governmental fund types, those assets for debt and for fixed assets do not get booked in the, those financials. So this is the one place where you can go and see everything. What do we have for debt load? What do we have for fixed assets? 
and all our other liabilities and assets. And if you're looking down, it basically it looks like your net position, you have about, in the government of, uh, activities, you have about 8,999,883 in net position. And again, that net position is made up of all assets. It includes fixed assets as well. So it's not like you're sitting with that in cash necessarily. It's, it's a variety of assets and, and subtracting out all those liabilities. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the government wide because it's not where a lot of towns your size focus. Where they really focus is on what we call the fund financial statements, which starts on page 11. So page 11, and, and mostly what people are looking at is the general fund. How did we do? How did you end up? This is, again, a snapshot of what your general fund balance sheet looked like at June 30, 2018. So if you look down, you, you'll see the first column over to the left. Total assets, 2,466,982. Total liabilities, 1,299,434. When you get down to the bottom after subtracting all your assets and liabilities, your fund balance is about is 21196, which I believe is down last year from about 283. So you, you ended up uh, having a loss of about sixty or seventy thousand dollars, which is actually really good because you budgeted to have a loss of I believe about 130,000. So again, some positives on the revenue side and some positive on the expenses side led you to have less of a loss than what was expected when you were doing your budgeting. When you look at the rest of the, if, if we're looking at page 14, basically 14 to 15 are the same kind of thing. This is your balance sheet and income statement for the, for the wastewater fund. And so you're looking at page 14, you see exactly what we, the total assets of 1,204 with no real long, no real liabilities, and the net position is 1,204,559. And again, that's pretty darn close to where you were. If you look at Exhibit Z, G, you'll see it's pretty darn close to where you were last year. You ended up losing about 29,09, and so your fund balance net position is right around in the wastewater fund where it was last year. I'm going to kind of skip through a little bit. So if you're looking at page 19 through 42, these are what we call the notes to the financial statements. So what this does is gives you a lot more detail and information on certain, on certain things within the financial statement itself. If you want to know where, you know, if your cash is insured, if you want to know what kind of investments you have, if you want to know what kind of receivables you have and payables, these notes give you much more detailed information. As you look down the balance sheet and income statement, it'll talk about you know, contingent liabilities or anything out there. It gives a, a real good narrative specific to each individual kind of item. So if you're looking for more detail than what you see on the balance sheet and you want to dig into it, you can look into those footnotes and you'll be able to go through and see all that. And let's just focus on one real quick. If you go to page um, 31 and 32, you can see there, that's listing all your debt. It's listing all the, the, uh, the bonds you have. It's listing the rates. It's giving you when the, the payments are due. And it's giving you the maturities. So if you were li really trying to just focus, geez, what do we have for debt? These footnotes give you a really good information on interest rates, terms, and all that stuff you have going. And the reason I bring this one up is, is Dean and I have had some conversations about, you know, um, I know in the last couple of years you've had a couple new bonds, and I know you guys are looking at new bonds coming up maybe over the next few years. And one of the things that Dean and I have kind of been going back and forth on is, you know, geez, how much debt is too much? How much is enough? And, you know, one of the things that I, I kind of uh, mentioned to him, and I told him I talked to the board about it, is it's, it's really hard to tell. There's no real, like, ratio analysis or that. It's really kind of a board issue. It's kind of a taxpayer issue. I'll go to municipalities that are your size. They'll have triple the debt load that you do. But I'll also go to municipalities that are your size, and they have none. So it, it literally is just how much over the years were you funded in reserves? Were you able to use reserves to pay for a lot of the stuff that other towns might be borrowing for on a, re on a relatively consistent basis? And so there's no real magic to the number, but what I always try to stress is you want to keep an eye on it and you want to keep knowing how it affects your tax rate. 
How much is the debt associated with the tax? When you're voting your budgets each year, the debt payments, interest, and principal, what are they costing you? And how is that affecting the tax rate as you move forward and as you plan to move forward? So that's just something to kind of keep an eye on. So in summary of that, because that's a good point, we might have some things that are coming up, perhaps a library addition, perhaps another fire vehicle. So we have three <coughs> ongoing bonds, of yep. which one of them is finalized next calendar year. I believe that's correct, yes. So my sense is we're clearly in a manageable I, I, I would state. I would consider it a manageable stage, of, and I... And, it's what I would consider is you want to keep your eyes and ears open as to where you're going, look long term, and make sure you plan it out so that you can minimize the effect on the tax rate. But yes, I would say based on what I've seen here, definitely in a manageable situation for sure. Um, if we're looking at pages uh, 43, this one you've probably seen over and over during the year. 43 to 47, this is your budget actual of your general fund. This pretty much explains how you made and lost money during the year. It, it, you know, if you're going down, you can clearly see like the Thompson's point rent when you're budgeting 802,500, came in a little less than that. Came in at like 774, 084, and I believe that was because of a reappraisal, Dean, is that right? Yes. yes. And so, so there was a, this, this is a great little document to see where did we over, um, overachieve in revenues and where do we overspend in our expenses to, to get to that 60000 or that $72,000 loss during the year. Like I said, if you look at page six of six, you can see where you budgeted. Halfway down the page, you'll see the negative 132. That's what you were budgeting to lose during the year. And what you ended up doing is actually losing only 72000 So that's where the positive came in for that. And the rest of the pages in the back are the rest of the other funds. I know you have a lot of reserves, you know, the restoration of records, the reappraisal, ski program, conservation commission. If you're looking for any of the details on those funds, and again, a snapshot of the balance sheet and income statement of each of these funds, they're all sitting here in the back. Just so you know, normally as part of this process, you probably would have a management letter in front of you. A management letter will tell um, will outline for you any significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in process or controls. And the reason you don't have it in front of you is because it's a clean management letter and there are none. We had, we had not, we, during the course of our audit, we did not identify any weaknesses in internal control that we needed to report in the, in the report. There were things that we, when we're in the middle of our audit, we'll talk to Mary and Dean about ways to do certain things. And if they rise to the level of something that has to get reported, we report them. Otherwise, we just go about and just kind of train as we do our audits so that we're all still working to you know, learn and keep getting better at what we're doing. The last document I want to whip through real quick is the, is the, is the letter Dean handed to you today. It should be on gray. Uh, this is what we call the audit committee letter. Again, this is just a required commu communication. Um, from the auditors directly to the board. Um, the things we tell you in it basically saying we we're supposed to identify if there were difficulties encountered in performing the audit. There were none. If there was any uncorrected misstatements in the audit that nobody, that they didn't get fixed, there were none. Were there any disagreements with management as we did our audit? There were none. So again, those are just required communications. I wanted to point those out, but that's what's in that letter. So this is your first year where you have not made recommendations. You've had, over the years, various levels of recommendations. And yep. we've created policies. And I think a lot of that fraud was- Fraud analysis, different things that you had suggested. Absolutely, I, I believe a lot of that we worked over the last few years, and almost in the goal to get to this point, yeah. where we weren't gonna have any, uh, you know, hopefully any findings. I mean, it's not that it's a bad thing to have findings or recommendations. But you want to try to uh, minimize them as much as you can. And over the years, you've done exactly that. We've kind of attacked it four or five years ago when we first started and hit a lot of them right away. And then over the years, the rest of them have kind of filtered off. And, and I think you're at a real good spot right now for getting good, accurate financial reporting. And uh, you know, like I said, I think the lines of communication with everybody here are really positive. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with everybody. So. 
I think we got an A plus last year too. I believe I believe that's how we termed it. Yes. I had a recommendation though. That was the fraud analysis, which we did. Yeah. You know, we sat around and we took your recommendation. I think you had a, either you were you were here, I think, for that. Yeah. So yeah. That, that was good. Well, I appreciate your work. No it's problem. Accommodations to Mary and uh, Christina, the work they do, and Dean working together. I think that's 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 really good. Great. Appreciate your coming down. Thank you. You'll answer the phone. We have questions now to get about as we move forward. That sounds good. I'll be here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rick. Nobody has any questions, I take it, on this topic? No. No. Not with a report card like that. What can you say, right? <laughs> Thank you. I kick a sleeping dog. <laughs> okay, so we have a lot of folks here representing uh, trails and folks interested in trails. And Jim Donovan is here, and I think you'd kind of like to lead us through this discussion and the purpose of this discussion. Sure. is working thank you um, is it working all right okay um, yeah I'm, I'm Jim Donovan I'm a landscape architect that uh, lives in the town I'm working with the town to find the actual detailed alignment of the trail along State Park Road from the end of the Melissa and Trevor Mack trail down to the intersection with Mount Phila Road um, would it help if I rotated this slightly, or would you not be able to see it? Oh, well, we can see it. If I um, yeah, go ahead, move it. Yeah. So that it's slightly that easier. Eh. Losing my base. Okay. Um, not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm I'm working in the dark anyway. Uh, all right. Um, we have about an hour here, so the purpose of the project is to find this fine-tuned alignment based on the recommendation of an alignment from the previous uh, scoping study. Not necessarily sticking with the exact type of trail, but the idea that it's going somewhere on the north side uh, of State Park Road. Sure. The purpose of this particular meeting is to look at the options that our steering committee the options our steering committee has developed uh, and to get public opinion as to which one or which combination of those opinion uh, all options would be most appropriate for the trail alignment so what I'd like to do is go over some of the very basics of that and then look at the details um, and point out the basic differences between what are primarily two options to look at the I'm working with a steering committee that is made up of uh, landowners along the area, representatives from the select board, from the planning commission, um, the tree warden, the, uh, I keep, I keep wanting to call you public works director, but it's not, it's a highway, highway commissioner. Um, and uh, others in the, the town that are helping us develop these things. And the first thing they did was to develop as many different options and ideas as they could based on this basic alignment, and we looked at them and threw out a bunch of them and came up with these two final options. Uh, and we've recorded all those, and we recorded our reasons as to why we would eliminated them so that as we move forward, there's a record of what was considered in case it comes up again. Hopefully, you've looked at it, and I realize today we haven't because as we're, I was out walking this morning on a field walk, I thought of another sort of semi-variation uh, of this thing, which I'll, I'll explain tonight. Um, and again, I'll go back and I'll record that to make sure that it's all recorded. <clears throat> um, we're not actually talking tonight about the merits of the trail itself. That's a different discussion that has to take place with the select board at some time in the future. Right now, we're only talking about this alignment option. Um, and the uh, looking at the, at the trail to show it along this here we realize this really doesn't help you a lot it's just too small a detail so we enlarged it into four sections those four 
um, rectangles show the sections and I'm going to move over there where we have the, the details shown up there. But what I do want to point out is that we are not obliged, as you're thinking about the, all these things, to say we want option A, which is the yellow one, or option B, which is the blue one. You can go from option A to option B to option A to option B as we move along here, depending on where we are and what you think is the best option. Obviously, it's easiest to kind of change at those spots, but we're not limited. If you feel like we need to change right here, we can do that. So I'll be interested in getting your comments of um, how you want to do that uh, and what, what you think might be best and most appropriate. Lastly, um, another option came up, and I'll describe that. We haven't analyzed it, but a real quick looking at some of the maps, and it came up yesterday. So I did a really fast analysis today, and I'll, I'll explain to you what that is. It's not totally set whether it's going to happen or is possible, but I wanted to make sure that if it does become possible, we've looked at it, and we don't have to come back to people later on. So with that, I'm going to move over. And Dean, um, yeah, I, yeah, I guess we can start here. Uh, I was going to possibly start the other way, but you I start think I'll go that way. We'll just go with that one. So the details, OK, sorry, Fritz. Oh, you're, you're fine. <laughs> um, the details um, start with figure six at the west end. And that's this one right here. And this is the uh, end of the trail, State Park Road. And it goes as far as Vineyard View Drive over here. What's not showing on this particular aerial, um, because I can't find one that had enough detail, is that there's now a house here. Uh, and there's now a small fence in this area. Um, part of that fence projects into an easement. And these red things, and I'll, I'll show you, on, it, it shows up better on the larger scale, are easements. We have no easement on the first property. We have a five foot easement in from the edge of the existing right of way for a trail, which is this red line. So we, we can move back a little bit further uh, in this particular section. And the basic difference is that the yellow line pretty much stays about four to five feet away from the edge of the road and just consistently stays in that unless there's some obstacle that we, we need to move around. And the option B, the light blue one, pushes out as far away from the road out to the edge of the right of way or here out somewhat to the edge of the uh, easement as possible. In this particular section, there's not a big difference between the two alignments overall in terms of impacts or costs. The biggest difference is that you're further away from the road with the blue option than you are with the yellow option. However, um, this is probably going to shift down this way a little bit more in the end because there is a drainage swale right here. And in order to avoid having to fill that or move it, if we shift this closer to the road, it will be almost the same as the yellow alignment there. So there's not a real big difference between the two here. And over here, we're probably going to shift the yellow one, the one that's close to the road, back a bit. Because again, there's a swale here. And if we shift it back a ways, we don't have to deal with putting in a culvert or making sure we deal with that drainage, which helps us lower the cost uh, overall. So we're, we're not um, ideologically saying, OK, we're four or five feet away from the road, period. We're keeping it close to the road, but we're moving it a bit. They'll both need to have a culvert in this section. So again, no matter which one we go with, you have that same expense. And we're probably going to suggest this blue alignment here. And, it, and uh, the analysis actually has these very detailed comparisons for each of these sections that looks at all sorts of different things. Pink means not good. And this is green, but my printer is running out of a particular color, so it's not green means it's a good thing. And this is actually gray, meaning it's not good or bad. Um, so in every case, we've compared it to doing nothing. If we don't do anything at all, if we go with option A, the yellow one, option B. And so you can see that this one has a lot more pink, which is A. That was initially when I was putting it here. That was all <coughs> basically saying we've got to deal with the drainage. We have to do all those things. If we shift it back, all of that pink goes away, pretty much. Um, and then down here in the bottom, it's also the, the pink was for the, this one dealing with the drainage. And if we shift it forward, that goes away. The last thing it said is we're going to have to, if we stay with the blue, 
we're going to have to shift and move that fence. There's a new fence that comes down a little bit into that easement area that the landowner put in. However, if we just shift this a little ways towards the yellow, we avoid moving the fence, which makes a lot of sense because then we don't disturb the neighbor. They've already put it in. Even though it is an easement, we don't really need that room because there's nothing going on here. We can shift it forward. As we come in, we cross over Vineyard View, and then we start to see a difference, which is in the next one, and we'll move over to that one in a second. But before we move, do that, this is the one where a major change sort of came in, and we've got two out of three landowners that have said yes to it. Um, this landowner right here that has the house and the adjacent landowner here have gotten together, and they say, well, they don't mind if we actually go up along Vineyard View this way and shoot across the property here and then just go right along the very edge of the vineyard right here and connect over there, which pulls us totally away from the road for this first section, which would be far better <laughs> in any case. But we don't know yet what this landowner is going to say. And I haven't looked at it in detail. The only thing I can see that could potentially be an issue right now is I need to go back to that original study and see where they looked at archaeological resources. They have said that there's no impact to archaeological resources for anything that we put along State Park Road, so we don't have to worry about that. So I didn't look at that closely. But now that we're looking at this area, I have to go back to that report and say, does that hold true for back here as well? So that's the only thing that we might have to look at. And if doing an archaeological study means we can do that, Maybe we end up paying for an archaeological study, which might be $3,000, $4,000 to do an initial study um, to confirm that that route works. So that's the only thing I can see. But I wanted to throw that out there so that if everybody thinks that's the best route, we're ready to go with it if all those other things fall in place. So before we move on, I'd like to see, does anybody have any options here in terms of which, which alignment they think is better overall between... A, B, or undrawn C that's, that's up at the top. Did, did you have? I just had a question. Yeah. If we did go with that, the new option, yes. would you then give up the, the rest of the easement for yes. the landlord? Um, yeah, my bet is that we give up this easement because they're giving us an easement up here. I mean, the, the Wilson Trevor Mac Trail easement. No. No, no, no. This, this would stay coming out at the I end see. because you, want, you still want that to come out yeah. to the road here. Okay. Um, so that would stay. I'm thinking, and this would just be up here and come across and come out. However, maybe if the only way to get this is they say, okay, we'll give up this and we'll give you that, then we have our connection to the road over here rather than over here. And maybe having that connection further away from the, the, the main intersection down here wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. There's no motorized vehicles on the trail, right? Right, right. It's, there's no motorized there vehicles be a on the trail. On there wouldn't be a big impact on the Vineyard View Road itself. No. And we would probably cross the road and go behind the trees over here. Right. But I just meant if there were and motorized vehicles. Yeah, no. There, there, should, there, there is not any motorized vehicles, as far as I understand, on our trail. And it's basically non-motorized travel. So does anybody have any comments in terms of which ones they think might be most appropriate in this section? I'd go with your newest one for sure. OK. Or the blue one. The blue one? Second. You know, with some of the modifications that we yeah. talked about. To be further away from the road. As, as, as far as you can be, yeah. as far out. Yes, uh, Is the blue line behind the line of trees? Uh, um, bo um, both of them are in front of the line of trees. It's in front of the line of trees here. And over here, it's still somewhat in front of the line of trees because we, don't, we have no easement here at all. So we have to stay in the right of way. And here, it's only... Uh, I think it's a five-foot easement. Yep. Um, and so we, we don't have enough room to get behind the trees for this easement. So further down we are. However, there's not a lot of trees in here, and we're far enough in front of them that I don't anticipate losing any of those important trees. By the way, we did look at existing conditions. We had a public work session on existing conditions. Um, and these trees were sort of the significant trees around the road that had habitat value or visual impact value or just were good trees growing along there and they weren't weed trees or large invasive trees or things like that. So that's what these green dots are. And later on you'll see little X's 
on some of these. That means that we anticipate we might lose that one. You'll see that there's no X's along here. So we don't anticipate losing any of those important trees. So in your opinion, what are the maintenance implications of having the paths close to the road where snow plowing is going to dump stuff onto trail materials versus right. running around um, into the field? We have, one of the things we've said that in general, the yellow line is going to be a little more difficult to maintain in the winter because it is close to the road and it will get snow on it. So that's actually down here in the bottom. This bottom one talks about maintenance and, and things like that. And you'll see that there's a lot of red um, over here. And that one is, is the maintenance. The, the difference, they're about the same except for that. I mean, I would think and then either of This one would be great right. because you don't have to worry about about anything from the are going to be road degraded at all by all that activity on the road either right. the two close to the road or yeah you're 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 not going to get as much because you're further out here but you're still going to get a little bit yeah, of snow drift but, material but you will get material here in the winter and you'll have to deal with that and it might not be as usable in the winter for snow skiers or cross-country skiing uh, i mean cross-country skiing or snowshoes or whatever because of that would the option c or three be an eight foot it would, um, it would probably be 10 foot easement overall, I would say, because this one is just adding to the right of way, and we need to have it a little bit wider, because the path would be eight feet, yeah. So the easement would be a little bit wider than the path. The type of path is the, sort of the same everywhere, although we might have to narrow this one a little bit to get around some of these things. The reason I ask is um, I remember one of our advisors saying a six foot path for bikers going both, both ways, ways. It's tight. It's tight. It's tight. Yeah. It, although it does work if you're not on a bridge or something. It's tight, but it can still work. Once you have a bridge and there's railings, then it becomes really tight. The, the beauty of option C, though, is that you're not next to the drainage ditch exactly. on the road and worrying about you know someone not paying attention to what they're right. doing, looking out at the Adirondacks and flopping into the ditch. Yeah. So. so it, it, I, I'm trying not to influence anything, but I really like C a lot. <laughs> does, does option C eliminate the, the fence? Movement? No, no, it, it totally avoids the fence altogether because the fence is right here, and option C would come down here and be on the other side of the road, so it's nowhere near the fence. But I would anticipate that no matter what we do, we probably won't impact that fence because it doesn't make sense to do the it. The second house maybe is north of that. Without going in, sir, uh, the second house is about up here, I think, right about in that area. And this, this easement here would still be on your property, I believe, right? Yes. Yeah. So it would still be on this landowner's property. Um, I think I've got a consensus on this, so let's move on to the next one. <clears throat> um, this. Yeah. Can I ask that we, we think we don't have a consensus to go behind the property, but can we get a second alternative right. in case they, we they, can't uh, get that easement? What I was getting was that most people like the blue. Yeah. As okay. far away from the road as we can make okay. it. So that, that seemed to be what everyone was thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, now we get into a challenging section. This is the middle section here. If you know State Park Road, this is where it drops down. And Thorpe Brooks comes through, and then it comes back up again. There's a lot of trees along the road here. Um, I'll move that over this way. Does it come over anymore? <laughs> yeah. Because I don't want to stand in front of, yeah. of the image too much. Does that work? Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, we have the yellow and the blue. This one, the basic concept is that yellow stays between the tree row and the road, up roughly four to five feet off the road, although it, it gets narrower at places, and I'll, I'll tell you why. And the other one, we push it out. Here we have a 100-foot easement area along this particular property. We don't have that entire easement area to use, but we have a 20-foot easement that we can locate anywhere within that 100 feet. Um, we've opted not to push it out to the very edge of that 100 feet because we've got a significant wetland along Thorpe Brook. It, the delineation kind of stopped there, but this wetland continues all the way up here. And so we're not trying to slice through the middle of it. We're trying to, if we cross it, cross it sort of at the bottom. So we've looked at two options here. One is 
taking the blue path and we have to kind of do a little bit of a switch back to get down the slope going to that wetland, crossing that wetland a little bit away from the road. This is probably 30 to 40 feet away from the road in that location. And that can be crossed either by a boardwalk or a bridge. And then we have a little bit of a switch back to get back up and we stay um, again sort of away from the road. Uh, we have significant trees close to the road here and then there's a lot of smaller weed trees, dead elm trees, um, invasive species that have grown really large uh, and so that we're not really taking any important trees out in that area. <clears throat> We've also looked at what if we we go with that same concept but we shift it as far as we can close to the road. If any of you know that area as you go along there's a small shoulder and then it drops down maybe 15 feet we put that boardwalk almost right there, right next to that slope. So you're, you're still separated from the road, but we're at the very edge of this wetland area here and we're not slicing it pretty much at all. We're just sort of extending a little bit the, the fill uh, that already cuts it across as part of State Park Road because that, that wetland also continues this way. The difference between the bridge and the boardwalk is that the boardwalk would be probably a little bit lower and it would have a lot of supports on it um, going across all the way. The bridge would pretty much have maybe two supports about here and here so that there's three sections. The boardwalk can be constructed right from the edge as probably most of you can understand. You can move in a little bit, put down two supports, build your boardwalk and sort of keep working on it so you're not really disturbing the wetland very much at all. You're building over the wetland all the way. The bridge, you'd have to actually get in there and build two foundations. So you've got to go in, disturb that wetland. But in the end, you only have two supports in the wetland here. You have a lot of supports in the wetland for the boardwalk. In, in either case, whether it's a, in either location, you'd have that difference. What that means is that long term, there's probably more impacts to wildlife moving up and down this corridor with a boardwalk because it's not quite as high than there is with the bridge. But the bridge has more wetland impacts to begin with, fewer wetlands overall, and the big part, it's more expensive. <laughs> Not that much more expensive than the boardwalk, but it's still more expensive. How far up is the bridge compared to, I mean, the boardwalk's right near the- uh, The boardwalk, I'd say the boardwalk might be six to seven feet high, because the, the lower you go on this slope, the more you have to sort of do switchbacks and cutting. So the higher up you can make mm -hmm. it, we limit how much we have to cut into the side slope going down. So I'm thinking that it might be six to seven feet, whereas the bridge might be eight to 10 feet or more um, the above. The bridge would still be below the road level? Um, the like bridge would still feet? be below the road level here, but not that much. <clears throat> so we're showing the switchbacks in both cases here. Um, I had initially said we're probably gonna lose two trees here with this bridge. If we move it out just a small bit, we can probably even save those two trees. That's if you want to really push it in as tight as you can. So I've assumed the worst and said we'll lose two trees there. With the yellow one close to the road, we have some issues. There's a drainage ditch here. We have to do some filling in this area. Um, and we have to either cover this drainage ditch or, or <clears throat> basically we have to cover this drainage ditch or take out this row of trees, one or the other. We opted to keep the trees and put in a drainage, basically a culvert underneath the road here to carry that drainage until it pops out over here. Then we need to add a little bit of fill in this area because there's, um, the, it, the drainage ditch opens up and wa washes down into the, the lower wetland area. So we'd have to extend the culvert a bit and put some fill in here. We have to do a little bit of filling here. This is, if again, there's this large willow cluster um, we might be able to save all those willows, but we'd have to narrow the road, the path to about five feet, or cut the willows down, at least the front ones, um, to make the path about six to eight feet wide, but it would still be very close to the road there. And we need a little bit more fill as we get over towards the culvert. We don't have to extend the culvert itself because it's already down pretty, down pretty far and sticks out way past where we are. And then there's another drainage canal that come, channel that comes down this way, so we'd have to do that same thing again here um, of putting that into a culvert underneath the, the trail. So the big difference 
is that this one has a lot of drainage work. This one doesn't have the drainage work, but it has the switchbacks and we might need to do, as we're, we're sort of cutting across the slope, we might have to cut in a bit and fill a little bit. So we'd either have a cut slope and a fill slope, or because we're close to the wetlands, you might do it as retaining walls so that you're minimizing your, your cut and fill uh, along that slope in the buffer area of the wetland. So that has that expense plus the expense here. So the, the other one I said is almost the same. The cost of them are almost the same. Here, this one, the cost is significantly different. Even with this uh, drainage work, um, the cost for, oh boy, I think I better put the glasses on. Oh, they're there. Thank you. <laughs> um, this one is about maybe 120,000 for this section, and it's about 365,000 for the boardwalk for this section, or it goes up to about 415 to 420 if we make it a bridge, and that's roughly the same whether we're on the blue or the white. There's a little bit of so you can see there's a, a significant difference in this one between the blue and the white. That's just for this section. That's just that, again that's the cost for just this section. Um, and the biggest difference in expense is obviously the bridge and the boardwalk. So it would be possible to say do this, but then shoot up here. You avoid all this drainage work, but then shoot up here, do the yellow, and then shoot back here again. Something like that would be an option. Um, and would that take away some of the cost? Well, it would take away all the cost of the boardwalk, which right. in the bridge, which some is the biggest one, and it would it that. would take away the cost of the drainage that you have here. Um, so it's taking away the big expense items in both options. So and I noticed as we were in the field today, um, I was doing a field walk this morning. In here, we we might actually be able to pop back here because we have this large easement sort of behind here, we'd still be fairly level and pop out uh, right about here and save all of this drainage work as well, which, which again is almost saying it's not quite the blue, it's the yellow kind of close in, <laughs> which again just occurred to me this morning, um, if everybody likes the yellow overall. But as you go this way still, you can see that there's other trees that are sticking out pretty close to the road. Some of these um, and I led a field walk yesterday and today. We've decided it probably would be possible to go behind some of these, so these numbers will be less. Uh, I think we said there were about four trees that we'd shown initially to be eliminated that we probably could save out of these yellow X's. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So about half of them would be saved. So we're losing four rather than eight in that area. Jim, let me ask you a question. So yes. <clears throat> If we look at, you've, you've only gone through two sections, but there's a way, if you accept the yellow section, would you say that's 170 feet, would you tell me? R roughly about 170 to 180 feet. If you accept feet. that yellow section there closer to the road, mm -hmm. as you go through the, what you've already told us, you can do a compacted eight foot wide trail with no cost other than the traditional compacted trail. I mean, you don't need bridges. You don't need primarily. There's a little bit walls. of fit. You, we need a little bit right in here, right over a the culvert. Retaining wall or, or culvert okay, work. Probably no, just a retaining wall or a little bit of fill. But we're already sloping down there, so it would probably be maybe a small one to two foot. But you can wall. almost get away if you accept that piece with a compacted trail without right. a lot of construction. Without a lot of construction work, if you if you kind of stick with this shift out here, and then shift back here again. And that still gives you a meandering trail right. only against the road in that spot. And we're only, yeah, you're far away from the road except for right here. Right. Uh, and there's, unless you do the bridge or the boardwalk, there's no way of getting around being really right next to the road in that section. Yeah. In that scenario, I'm imagining it would be essentially the blue trail to the yellow, and then after you pass the wetlands back to the blue. How soon on the east side of the wetlands would you be able to reconnect with that blue? Because I know that there's a, there's a slope there. So where would you be able to reconnect? Probably right about here, right through that area there. But you're, you're crossing a drainage plane here as well. We, we, we have to cross the drainage, but it's, it's a little culvert as you cross rather than 
like 80 feet of culvert underneath the trail uh, because you're taking away the drainage ditch in that area. And do you have a budget estimate using no. that? No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, in the end, these budgets are real rough budgets for comparison purposes only. Once we have the alignment, I'll go back and I'll do a much more detailed uh, cost estimate for it taking into account whatever alignment we decide we think is best. Yes? If we take option C, budget mm -hmm. by property, would you not enter Jonathan's property further north? You could potentially enter it further north and come this way. I haven't looked at that. So for the moment, I've assumed we've come down here and we're going like this. But there is the option that we could cut off that corner and go up to about here and cut across as well. So yes. However, coming this way gives you, especially if, if we end up eliminating this section here, would give you that access to the road um, for people, say, on this side or whatever that, that want to get in. You could always do a spur here and do that as well, yep. or just use the road yep. as your access and have the trail go like this. So I, I haven't looked at that, so I haven't shown it, but that could definitely be an option. Yes. Oh, where your blue joins the flight. Yes. And it goes down and then curls back up. And you were saying at that point it would then perhaps could come down to the yellow. Mm -hmm. um, is that a bridge also, that little white section, or is it just a... No. This section from here to here is bridge. This section is just coming down the slope. And we'd probably try to do that so you minimize, uh, make that connection work so you minimize the need for the retaining wall. We're trying to keep the path at 5%, which is ADA, the maximum you can go for ADA accessible. We're trying to keep the whole trail ADA accessible. We can exceed that for small sections. So if, we have, if, it, if there's only a tiny section, we have to go over that, and we can do that and then get rid of retaining walls. We do that, but we want to minimize how much we go over that 5%. So I've lived in the property across the street for 24 years now. So that wetlands to the north there, I've seen that thing fill up with water and, and a lot of material coming down mm -hmm. to Thorpe Brook. So I'd, I'd be concerned about the long-term viability of putting anything in the mm -hmm. bridge or walk, particularly something that's only six feet off the ground. Right. That thing gets to six feet all the time. Okay. All the time. See, and that's something we, we don't have that info. Yeah. So if we did this, we'd make sure we look at that and it may end up being eight feet or nine feet if yeah. people decide that's what they want. And if they don't go that way, then they don't worry about it. And unfortunately, the sight lines for people being close to the road there and that dip are not right. great. Right, and that's, that's the bad part about this option because you're, you're right next to the road in a part that you don't have really a lot of visibility. So that's, that's the nice part about these, but it, it is a lot more money. And you can't go back behind the wetland? No, the wetland just keeps going. It doesn't end here. We just, we just stop, but it just keeps on going. So yes. if you did have it, that section up by the road, we would definitely have some safety barriers between the paths. We could the probably put some temporary ones um, that are there for the summer because you don't necessarily want to put a, a barrier that's a permanent barrier because then it makes it Plowing. difficult for Jimmy to plow in the winter. But you might be able to have some of the, um, what is it, on Swift Street uh, coming west from Dorset the path is almost right next to the road that they have there. They'll put the little yeah. plastic tubing things that are separators. Something, something like that, if we, we feel we need it, we can try to put along there. You don't want to, and again, because we're trying to minimize how far we're pushing this way, because the more you push this way, the more you need a wetland permit. Um, we're going to need a wetland permit no matter what we do here, because we're in the buffer here, we're in the wetlands there. Um, but getting a buffer permit is a lot easier, especially when it's right next to a road, than it is to get the wetland permit to cross the wetland. Yes, that, that bank is, you know, doesn't get a lot of activity, obviously, you not know, pick up trash off of it and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But once we put a path on it and people start using it, then there are far more concerns about erosion taking place. Because that, that is a fairly steep slope. It is a steep slope. slope. Yeah, and so that, it, that would probably be definitely something that we have to think about uh, and making sure that we've stabilized things even if it's doing some additional plantings along that edge, whatever, to make sure that we stabilize it. And that would probably also be part of our uh, wetland permit application. Would there be a different cost, I mean, uh, analysis done for 
how far you want it away from the road on that slope. I mean, right now you have it five feet away from the road, we'll say, and you need to put in a one foot retaining wall. And if you wanted it seven feet or eight feet away from the road, would there have to be a three foot retaining wall and what would be the cost difference? Um, we haven't done that because we looked at moving it further out and it took away so many trees and you're disturbing, you're going onto that slope. Mm -hmm. um, and the chances of getting that, getting a permit to do that are really slim. It's, it'd be a lot easier to, to actually have it in the wetland next to that slope than to disturb the slope because the impacts of disturbing that slope would be greater on the wetland and it's a four or five foot than, that yeah, it, yeah, it is a four or five foot culvert. It's a big very big thing. culvert that goes under there. I know. Um, and that we, we, I think either you wanna be on the top of the slope or basically like we've got on the white over on that side of the slope and you don't wanna be anywhere in between. Yes. Where they actually move the road markings a little bit to give more. Yeah, that's definitely something that we could work with Junior to see if he's willing to do in that area. Um, because we're limited on time, I'd like to see if anybody has any preferences here because I want to move on to the next two sections. <clears throat> so, um, does anybody like either any of these as they are now? How many people like the going with the blue and coming up to the yellow and then going back to the blue? Okay, I think we got it. <laughs> okay, so we can go on to the next section. <laughs> and again, the exact location may vary as we get into the fine tuning of it, but the, that's the concept that we'll work with for that area. Um, okay, the next one, it's, it's all shown on table uh, 2C but it's divided into two pieces. It's one property starting right here and going all the way, as you can see over there, there's two red squares in that one property that goes all the way out to Mount Philo Road. It's one property. Um, there is a potential for a 20 foot easement across the front edge of that entire property. Um, they recently came in for a subdivision. The subdivision has been approved, uh, but they have not filed their final plat. So we don't know yet whether it's actually going to be finalized. So anything that relies on that easement is contingent upon the easement actually happening. So the yellow one sticks within the right of way. Again, it stays roughly four to five feet off the road. We come a little bit closer here to try to save some of these trees. And again, in this location, there's some of these trees that it looks like we can go behind. Um, the exact distance we'd have to look at in terms of do we go one or two feet down that adjacent property or are we um, okay going behind it and still staying within the right of way. Some of these trees are pretty far out, maybe two or three feet off the road, so it looks like there's, there's room enough to go behind them. Others kind of fall smack in the middle and you, you kind of have to decide. Or we assumed, again, trying to show the worst case just in case we were taking them out. So again, you can see the yellows, all those yellow X's come out as part of putting in the yellow path. Um, the other big issue here is that up at this end, there's a lot of drainage coming in and we'd have to do a culvert extension and uh, a little bit of fill and a retaining wall there. And there's one other spot here. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, there's one other spot where we have to put a little bit of fill in. Um, to make enough area that's level for the path. That's right sort of in this area here. Uh, there were other places where I thought we had to do more, but we were able to sort of push the trail up and down uh, so it's not actually level with the road, and we eliminated some of those as we moved along. I thought there was yes. a variable easement on the western portion of that section. No, it's, it's the same. This, the variable easement is this 100-foot one on this property. Okay. But once we get into this property, okay. It's the 20 feet all the way along. Was that on the previous slide then? Um, the previous the variable slide, one. The variable one is on the previous slide. And you okay. can see right here where it goes up. Okay. That's the beginning of that variable easement that's on this slide right here. Um, so this one stays in front. The blue one obviously stays behind. 
The big issue with the blue one is that there are some wetlands in the forest area and that we're in a wetland right here. In order to save these trees, we want to go behind them, but that puts us inside the edge of a wetland. So we have to deal with a wetland permit here, which we don't have to deal with here, but when we move it out here, we're taking out some of those trees. So again, that's a balance. What do you think is um, the preference between those two? When we get over here, obviously, the green is the wetland areas. We're not in a wetland. We can stay behind. And then over here, the wetland comes up pretty close, so we're almost at the edge of that wetland, even if we're in the yellow one. But we bring the blue one in pretty, pretty tight to that yellow one, again, to avoid going further into this wetland area. This is all wound up into one wetlands permit? It would all be bound into one wetland permit because it's one activity crossing several things. It wouldn't be different. Okay. They may decide in the end, we don't like this, but we're okay with this. So they may only grant portions of what we asked for, but we submit it all as one. Um, and then as we get out into the field, there's no reason why we can't push out all the way out to the edge here. There's a driveway crossing that's happening here, so we keep it kind of tight next to the road. But as soon as we're past that p potential driveway crossing as part of the subdivision, we push it out as far as we can to the edge of that easement. And then we drop it back in because, as you can see on that larger map over there, there's more wetland, that green, as we get into the last image there. Um, so even though it's one large property, I'd like to see if anybody has any preferences here. I mean, we've got a kind of a real decision to make here because it's wetland impacts and it's some additional costs and hoping and trying to get that permit versus taking out trees. Okay, so that's a real decision you have to make. What would the wetlands impact me? The wetland, the wetland impacts, in my opinion, would be minimal overall because we're right at the very edge of them. This wetland, uh, I used to do wetland work, so I, I haven't done it in about 10 years, so I'm a little rusty on it, but I, at least I'm talking from some knowledge. Um, it probably has habitat value um, in there. It's in the middle of a forest area, but it's kind of low. There's not a lot of trees in there. Um, and it does flood water storage and flood water cleaning. So <laughs> if we're on the very edge of it, we're going, to minim we're going to impact those things, but the impact will be minimal because we're on the edge. And we can do some additional planting. We can actually uh, maybe even do a little bit of excavation out in here, create a little bit of, extend that wetland a little bit over here. We can do some plantings along the edge here to try to minimize our impacts and to enhance some of the values. So I think the impacts are somewhat minimal here. Over here, I think the impacts are very minimal because we're, this, this one, the vegetation that's in here right now is mostly invasive vegetation. It's a lot of buckthorn that's pretty large which they would not mind if you took out anyway. <laughs> um, so I see very little impact to that particular wetland. And as we get further down, again, I see very little impact, but I can talk about that one on the next screen when we get there. Yes? There wouldn't be any additional cost <coughs> for the wetland permit if it's all submitted in one, would there? Um, yes, there, there would. Um, well, let me step back. Uh, the, the permit, I haven't been able to check with them, so I don't know whether the permit fees are waived for municipalities. So based on just their normal fees, it's per square feet of impact to a wetland itself <coughs> and to a buffer area. So if we pull out here, our, the buffer impact fee is less than the wetland impact fee. So it would change the cost. The, as it's drawn now, the blue one, and assuming that we do the bridge or the boardwalk in the last one, the application fee itself is about $4,500. <coughs> the application fee for the yellow one is about half that right now, the way they're drawn, um, given the impacts to buffers and wetlands. Would there be uh, construction and maintenance cost differences between these two? Um, construction cost, I don't think there'd be a lot of difference. Because this is not a real soupy, wet wetland. It's a pretty dry wetland. It's probably wet <coughs> early in the year, and then it dries out. Um, and then it's probably wet again now, at near the end of the year. Um, so there's not that big a difference. You'd have a little bit more of a foundation you have to put in here than you'd have to put here. Um, Maintenance-wise, they'd be roughly the same. 
If you want to keep this sort of cleared in the winter, this one would be actually more maintained because again, that snow issue of, of trying to keep it clear while it's next to the road in the winter when there's snow. And that could either be done by Junior extending it out and just plowing it as if it's the road, or going back in, hiring somebody to plow it out after it's after the road's been plowed. Yeah, my opinion just for the two thousand dollar difference maybe in the wetland permit over the lifetime of the trail, a qualitative experience behind the tree line there seems um, like a much better mm -hmm. option in this section. <clears throat> I, I would agree with that and say it seems like it would be best to go for that. I mean, if they don't go for it, we, we can fall back could to, fall back fall back to this going one. out by the road, but it certainly would be a nice mm -hmm. experience. Then. Okay. From a scenic point of view, I think a lot of the initial issues with that wide transportation grant were that was that it was going to require a huge swath of trees to be cut. I think a lot more people are upset about that. Uh, so pushing it back and you know, putting it on the fringe of the wetland, especially if you can do further restoration mm -hmm. of another area, would seem much more mm -hmm. amenable to this. Okay, area. so again, because of time, it sounds like the blue is preferred, and we'll try to go for it. If we can't get it, we can fall back and do the mm -hmm. yellow and work to remove as few trees as possible. How long till we know if that if we have that right away? <clears throat> Um, that I don't know. So far, probably December or January. I just wanted to emphasize also for safety impact, being behind the trees is going to be much safer. And yes. Yeah. All of the sight lines. Are the sight lines are good. good here. Yes. And, it, and um, I usually try to, to, to talk in terms of um, user comfort. And, and people are much more comfortable there than if you're if right on the edge of the road. Even when we're doing our field walks and we're walking along the edge of the road, we're walking where the path would have been, and cars would zoom by, and it just didn't feel that like comfortable. Yeah. Uh, so it would be much more comfortable over here. Because the safety here is not that much different than a lot of other town roads uh, when you're walking along the shoulders. So it's, it's not a safety issue here that doesn't exist. It's just walking along the shoulder of a road. And, and <clears throat> which is not always fun. <laughs> uh, so the further you can push it out, the better. Okay, so we'll go with that one. Let's let's shift to the last section. I'm sorry, I keep moving away. I'm sorry about that. Um, here, you do have a lot of wetlands in the meadow. You can see over there that it is field. There's no forest there, but it's a wet meadow area. And going out to the edge of that easement slices off the um, edge of the wetland. It's a wet meadow. It primarily, again, because it's hayed a lot as well, it primarily deals with just transmitting strong, um, groundwater in this area. There's not a lot of habitat value to that particular wetland. There's not a lot of um, surface groundwater filtering. There could be a little bit of that. But it's primarily, because it's continually mowed, most of the, the merits of that wetland are underground or non-existent because it's mowed. Um, if it was allowed to grow up, it could probably gain more function in the future, but even they're proposing to use that as a uh, paddock area, so there's going to be horses in there, which is still going to have some impact uh, on the wetlands. However, having said that, I think that putting a, a, wetland, a, a trail like out at the edge of that particular uh, wetland will not really have a lot of impact. But since we're trying to do all these other things, I figured if we can minimize where we can, so I've suggested that the blue one come out here to the edge of that wetland along this section. And then it also sort of eliminates having to deal a lot with that drainage ditch. Um, so there's not a lot of difference between the blue and the yellow here, unless you decide, yeah, let's push it out to the edge of the right of way. And then we have more, the, the wetland, the wetland impact in terms of square footage will be roughly the same because we're still impacting the wetland here and here, but, but I've pushed it to the edge as far as possible to sort of acknowledge, we're, to show a and that we're trying to minimize our impacts, basically, to help us get these other things which I think are more important overall. Because this is pretty, pretty wide open. We're still separated from the road, visibility is good, uh, and in either case, this trail right here 
because you can see this big section here, that's where there's minimal, uh, there's less than like four to five feet of level area next to the road. And initially we were thinking, okay, we have to fill all this to make a wide enough area. But then we were looking at our cost, it was going to be very expensive. So we said, okay, let's forget that. Let's just lower this down so our average level is maybe two to three feet lower than the road. And we've eliminated all that fill. So you're separated a little bit by grade there as well. And then that would carry over into the blue as blue at the same time. So either one of them. You're lower than the road, so you're separated vertically and you're further out. Further, a little bit further out with the blue, less further out with the yellow. The last thing I want to point out is that potentially, sorry about that, <laughs> potentially we're looking at, say, three to four parking spaces that might be parallel parking along the edge here. Because we're at the end of the trail, it might be a trailhead. There is the parking um, associated with the park, but the park is experiencing a lot of parking pressures on their own. They're saying, we really hope people don't use that parking lot for the trail, so we're trying to put this in. But at the same time, people using the park may decide to use this parking space yeah. uh, <laughs> as well. So it's like, what do we want to do? So there's that option. We figured, let's put that out, see what people think about trying to put that in there. It may not go in now, but if we know we want to do that at some point in the future, we may just route these out a little bit further so that we're not getting in the way. And even as it is now, you can park there. When we were doing the field walk yesterday afternoon, a UPS truck came over here and parked for about 10, 15 minutes along the side of the road. So people are parking there already. So it's not going to take a lot to turn that into a parking area. It gets a little bit narrower and steeper as you get closer to that larger tree down here. And by the way, I didn't mark that large tree as a significant tree, even though it stands out a lot there because it's a, I think it's a red maple. It's definitely a maple and it's on its way out. A lot of the limbs are already dead. And so going through heroic efforts to try to save a tree that's already dying doesn't make sense. So we can always plant another tree there or plant a few trees there to replace that in the future. Um, but I didn't show that as a tree to be removed. It's going to be removed. It might, it might end up staying depending on which route we go, but long term it's not going to stay. And we're not going to go with heroic efforts to save it. So given all that, any preferences between yellow and blue? <laughs> okay. Um, sounds good. The only thing I would question is the yes. what's going to be between the parking lot and the trail. Up here, um, if it's blue, there'll be some grassed area. But in the end, you may even bring that down so that there's not a lot. There might be some markers. There might be a small fence. You might even have a small green green row where you put a few trees there to separate it. But you don't want it to be too far apart because people are going to be walking from the parking to the trail. Mm -hmm. So you have to have some way, the trail has to hit that parking area in some way. Um, so there's a way to get there when the ground is wet or whatever so that you're, you can get onto the trail immediately from the parking area. Right. I'm just trying to eliminate people from actually parking on the trail. Parking on the trail, yes. And whatever we did there, we'd, we'd make sure that that wouldn't happen. We've also shown potentially of a crosswalk here just to get over to the park because that, the park itself is a destination uh, for this end of the trail. The issue is that you, you want to try to have something here so you either go into the paved area or you might put a little level area that kind of takes you over to the road. So depending on what the park says, um, and we haven't heard from them whether they want this or not, but we're thinking that you'd probably put a crosswalk there. Eventually, if there's a lot of uses, you may end up putting one of those little flashing signs or something in the future, but I'd say put the crosswalk in to begin with, with just normal signs and see how much it's used, how much is respected. If we're having a problem, then we have to put more in. But we, 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 we study the issue. We don't just put it in and ignore it. We watch it to make sure that it's working or do we need to do more. So um, <clears throat> what happens now? We're going to take what came out of this. Uh, I'm going to put together sort of that alignment. We're going to go back and I'm going to talk to the steering committee to make sure that they agree with this. My bet, based on what I'm seeing from even the steering committee that's here and our discussions, they're going to agree with this. I, I don't see them disagreeing with much of what was decided here tonight. Um, and then we'll put that together and we're going to start our application to the wetland permit. We'll start talking to ANR about this, getting their input and knowing whether we can go with this and then putting that application in. 
It's going to be a tentative application because if we won't know about this until January, we don't, at, at the latest, we don't necessarily want to wait until January to start that process. If ANR says no, we, we have to know for sure, then we'll have to wait until we know for sure whether we can get this. And we might start this wetland permit portion and come back and do this one later once we know about that easement. So that application is for the grant? No, that application is for the wetland. Well, no, but the, 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 application, the basic application is for the grant. Basic application, and, and that's a different process, but we'll have this alignment ready now. And there's a- For two a, purposes. The wetlands and, and, and the grant. There's another thing is that the Trails Committee is going for more grants for construction work. Um, they already have some funds available. They're trying to get more grant money to fund as much of this as possible uh, along the way. So um, the wetlands permits are, are just by the foot, by the square foot? Uh, we, but the application is by the square foot. Um, I'm just wondering, I mean, if we put in one and we, put, and we don't have this 20-foot easement, we don't know when they say we've got to have it to finalize the, 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 per the wetlands permit. And so if you say, okay, we're going to put in the one, the major one in, right. is there, is there an additional cost I'm trying to get at? Whether if, if a second one is applied. If the second one goes in, there's a $250 processing fee, sort of like a, a basic application. That's the only difference. So it would be $250 more to split them apart. Okay. But I think it would be good to know to get this one going because we we definitely want to do at the very least this yellow and we still need a permit for that yellow one that comes up by the road um, so that one we definitely need this other the blue one we said okay we can pull back on that one which is in that the the area right here when it gets in the forest but it's still within that easement um, and here we could always go to yellow as well we're still going to need a permit because we're in the buffer but we're outside the wetland um, but that is totally within the right-of-way, yellow. So we don't need the easement for the yellow one. We need the easement for the blue one. So we will be doing that. Um, we've put in an estimated amount of time for what a and would take to review that. But again, that's, you never know. Um, it's a guess. <coughs> So what we have is that we're hoping to get that permit in, say, by the end of the month. We go all the way till about the end of January. At the end of January, hopefully we've got some decision and we, we talk to our steering committee again to see what came out of this. Do we have to modify? How do we want to modify? Are we okay with all the changes that we might have to make depending on that permit? And then um, when we finalize that layout, beginning of February, and we've got it tentatively scheduled for the February 11th select board meeting. Um, again, it's 6 or 6.15, so before that regular meeting that in theory starts at 7, although it looks like your meetings are just getting bigger and bigger <laughs> on a regular basis. Yes, um, and we thank you for that. <laughs> um, so February 11th is when we're going to have another public work session where we're going to present the draft final, whatever came out of this whole process. That's tentative because we're assuming we're going to get something back from a and If they're still pondering, we'll let everybody know it, it's not happening then and the schedule has to be pushed out. But we're hoping for um, that um, so that we present that, depending on what comments we get and if everybody agrees, fine. If there are still more comments and we might want to make some other additions, we've got a tentative one scheduled for March 11th, again, where we present changes that we've made since the February 11th one. But if everybody's happy with the one on February 11th, we're done, we go with that one and we try to move forward finalizing whatever else we need to finalize and hopefully finding out whether we have construction funds um, and try to move forward at that point. So the next time we're coming back to you will be February 11th. If any of you saw the, the announcements, there's um, an email for bike ped at gmabt.net, you probably all know the gmabt.net ending point, it's bike pad. If you have any other thoughts or comments, you can send them there. That's, that's my email that I use for bicycle and pedestrian projects. Um, and I'll get them and we can consider that. 
Uh, and we'll be making other announcements on Front Porch Forum and putting up flyers as we can as things move forward just to keep everybody informed as to what's going on. But the big thing now is, okay, we've got this alignment. Now we're going to start to talk to a and and see what they think about it and whether they agree and whether we can do what we want or we have to fall back um, and stay totally within the buffer areas. I guess the other piece of this is, is the grant application and that will be on the select board agenda in December, uh, December 10th. So any other questions or comments before we finalize? And we're close to 7.15. Pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> well, so, um, yes. Is there a cost difference or approximate cost difference between the yellow and the blue? Um, I have that shown uh, on these these, map, these analysis figures, which I think you might have, and down at the very bottom, the very last thing is the cost comparison between the two, the two things for each section. Um, I think, I don't know if I added them all up, because again, they're just sort of ballpark figures. They're more or less meant to help you see the difference between them. They're not terribly accurate because I was like, okay, it's how many feet, we have roughly how many feet of drainage. So I didn't do a really, really detailed one. I did a, a ballpark estimate to help us understand the basic differences on a ballpark level uh, of what the different options would be. So they show up here. Basically, the big difference, if you look over there, the big difference is in the second sheet where it says table 2B, the one that goes down, crosses Thorpe Brook, and comes back up, that one there's a significant difference between A and B. Very minimal differences between A and B on either end. So basically this one and the next one that are all on the Four Meadows property and the last one over here, they're pretty close together. They might be thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 difference as opposed to two to $300,000 difference. I have not done an estimate on C, which everybody liked. It's going to be more. Um, can, can, is it easy to bring up C? I'm sorry, I keep walking away from the mic. I just keep forgetting. <laughs> um, it would be f a six. Figure six. Because you're, you're going to have the same distance here. So that distance will be fine. You're going to add on a distance here. It's not going to be a lot, but you're, you're making it longer, so you're going to have a slightly higher cost because you have the cost of this trail portion in addition to the cost of this trail portion. Right, but you are But not, you're there's, not, there's nothing happening there in terms of drainage or culverts or anything. So it's, it's pretty much just basic trail cost, which is not that much. Right. Yes? Now that we have a... Uh, an ideal route. Yes. Could we get a cost estimate of the whole thing? When I bring it to the steering committee, um, I'm going to try to have that developed at that point. So you'll, you'll sort of see what that is um, for the whole thing. And it will either be this or, or this, depending on what we find out right. um, about what this landowner is thinking. I had one more question. Sure. I didn't realize that bicyclists will ride, you know, facing the traffic. They'll be on the same side. It'll be quite different. Right. I didn't realize that that's the way. Which is why you're trying to have well, that separation. And the, when we get close to the road, that becomes like an, a concern. Is that done in Burlington and South Burlington? Uh, yeah, like that, that section I was talking about in Swift Street in South Burlington, that's, that's exactly the way sure. it is. Um, and that's why they've put the barriers there to sort of create that visual and slightly physical separation so that as you're riding towards traffic, there's, there's some sort of separation between you. So in general, everybody seems to have liked further away. That's one of the reasons why. Um, because if you're on a bicycle, you're further away and you don't have that apparent visual conflict that you're riding into that traffic. Any other questions? Jim, I think that's Kim yeah. You know, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for all your work. <clears throat> Thank you nice for the job. time. We appreciate it. A lot of progress. Yep. Look forward to the next steering committee meeting.
Thanks to everyone for coming and providing input. This adds up. Hmm? It adds up. It does. It's okay. In your head. It's just amazing. It's 50, 80, 110, 300, yeah. 500. Yeah, those, those odd numbers, little. Quarter, 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 you know, $2,500 is, is, a hard, is a hard one to estimate when you're trying to do yeah. 10000 you know, on a shot. Yes. And, uh, yeah, I got three, four of them. Oh, well, there's another. Yeah, 1600 <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Those add up quick. Yeah, quickly. It's on the agenda. <clears throat> Christine. We're almost done? Hmm? We're almost done? We're almost done. <laughs> We're not that far behind schedule. We'll catch up. We're taking a short break. Apparently. Okay, everybody ready? Lost Fritz. Lost Fritz. Fritz. Okay, folks, we want to we want to continue our meeting if we could. Um, the next item on the agenda, is there any public comment? Sure. Okay, no comments from the public. Um, the next item is the 720 item, open bids for generators for Town Hall and Senior Center. We had two timely sealed bids. Two timely sealed bids. Are there any untimely unsealed bids? There was one timely unsealed bid. Email. Is that in the, so that's not here. Okay. So, um, so these must be Heck Electric. I don't know. References. So the eight, so the price is 18,000. Six hundred sixty dollars. This quote includes two twenty kW generators, material and labor for complete code compliant installation. For price of two, eighteen thousand six hundred sixty dollars. Could that be each or? It says total for two. Includes two. The total cost for this work it says total a couple of times. Yeah, we'll just hold them to it. it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do we put in the uh, up 50, next one 50 in the uh, <laughs> in the uh, article <laughs> wow that's pretty interesting isn't it well generator size is it can be an issue too so is that too small is that what you asked for uh, they're basing it on current use oh I see so hopefully it's right <laughs> It's a certain percent over current use? Uh, 115% of maximum use, which is kind of like an unofficial standard until, let's see, you have lots of things like compressors, refrigeration, particular compressors start under heavy load, and they take a lot to start. Hmm. Now we this have a refrigerator in here. And that's about this it. one has a price, but it doesn't say what the was in terms of volt. What's it terms of voltage or oh, uh, 20 kilowatts kilowatts. Yeah. This doesn't say how much. So this is Reliant Electric. Ethan Allen Drive, South Burlington. Quote for a complete installation of both generators. Twenty seven thousand one eighty seven. Includes a five year warranty but it doesn't say the size of the generators it's just assuming it's that was spec in the was the size spec or did they, they determine it from the usage? they were to determine it so we based need, on the usage so we would need to well we'd have to we're gonna have to call and find out what kind of generators they're using okay so the 
The one unsealed bid, how did that happen? Uh, the email. Is that what this is? And the emails were just not sealed? It's one of the guys that gave the original price. I hate to throw him under the bus, but. Should we publicly state it? He's not compliant. Um, I mean, it's, it's an interesting comparison, actually. The number, okay, the number, this is Brookfield Service. This is 54,100, which um, for the two. There's an awful lot on the table. We're gonna have to ask a lot of questions. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is 38 KW. Each? Yes. That's the town hall. This is non-compliant, but it does give you a reference. And the other one's 38 KW. It's a big difference between 20 and 38. Right. And the price, obviously. So this is a reference, but not, not didn't meet the bid requirements. So there's nothing more we do. We've accepted the bids. Right. We're going to schedule a selection at the next meeting or some future meeting. We'll have to come up. We'll come up with a little spreadsheet to compare apples manufacturers. To uh, well, definitely whether different in size. Yeah. Okay. Almost twice the size and twice the price. Money. Okay, Board of Listers. I think I saw the board come in. There's the board right there. Uh huh. The board is here. Um, so, just uh, want to do the errors and omissions for this year. Yep. And uh, the first one, it's pretty self explanatory, but 793 Orchard Road, um, they actually should have been combined because they were contiguous. I didn't realize that until after the fact. Um, and so, we went ahead and didn't make two lots, we just, we combined the two lots instead of valuing them separately. And the second one was a little out of procedure, but uh, basically the owner is marketing the home and he wanted the data to be all updated on the cost sheet. So we went ahead and reflected that this year. Instead of? Next year. Instead of next year. Yes. So that's the, up to 962. Right. Okay. Um, and so, the 793 Orchard, it did go up in value because you're combining the two lots, but the other lot essentially went away since it was, you know, so you're probably we're at a, um, about $140,000 less in value oh, overall goodness. of the, yeah. So it's less tax revenue. A couple thousand dollars, yeah. Then the IU, well, you add the 20, maybe you're 120,000 because the other one went up and that was, that was. That's true. So, so that's okay. the deal. That's pretty straightforward. So then we would do a motion and then see if there's any comments, right? Right, because it's your grand list, not my, uh, the listers. Okay. It, so. so is there a motion to uh, accept the borders, listers, grand list, errors, omission sheet? Yeah, I'll make a motion to accept the errors and omission sheet for the 2018 tax year. Second. This isn't dated, but it's today's oh, date, yeah. I assume. That's, yeah, that works. So November 13th, is that today? Yes. Okay. So we had a motion made and seconded. Um, are there any comments or questions from anybody? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Thank you. Very All right, thank you. Budget review, Charlotte Park and Wildlife Refuge. Why don't you folks come forward and re-educate us on where we're at. And so you have your handouts. Yep. So, yeah, so um, for the Charlotte Park and Wildlife Refuge, the total budget for we're proposing for next year is 16650 um, There were a few things that we lowered. Um, and first, up, first of all, we're not doing any ahead of the storm projects. They're both done. They were covered by grants, so it's not included. In the, there's nothing there in the budget for next year. Um, the other thing that's gone down a bit is, um, is uh, maintenance of signage, benches, and bridges. We break these categories. These are our own categories. But, um, and um, the reason is we've this year we wanted it to be out be, uh, because we were um, 
finishing um, the bog bridges the, that are on the lower trail, the Roberts Way Trail, and that's, that work's underway, it'll be done soon. And next year, the only thing that we um, are thinking we'll have to do still is to stabilize two bridges where there's a load, some erosion of the stream banks. Um, where we had an increase was um, we did add a little money for treatment of, for emer emerald ash borer if we decide to do that for some of the trees in the park. Um, we'll be evaluating that and seeing if there are trees that we do want to treat. There probably wouldn't be that many. Treat, but, meaning safe. Yeah. Well. Right, right. So um, uh, let's see. I think everything else is. What's the price to, for, uh, is it on here? What's that? For uh, a single tree, for emerald, emerald It varies. Emerald. It's going to vary on a diameter of the tree and maybe how far they have to walk to get to it. So far, we've seen just one tree that we might treat that's right next to the trail. There are a lot of ash trees in the park, but um, we probably wouldn't be treating that many of them. It's a two-year treatment. It lasts for two years. So right? this is twelve hundred in the budget. Then okay, so you're looking maybe four, three, or four trees. Yeah. yeah. And we also do have um, the money again in the budget this year for or next year for um, cutting trees because we do we have found that we need to have some. Usually there's some tree work that needs to be done. We have a lot that's done by volunteers and. Um, um, juniors cut trees, um, and sometimes we have some difficult trees to deal with, so um, we sometimes need to get tree service in to do some work. Do you have any questions? Well, going downward is always nice. <laughs> You're the first team that's been in here, the committee to have a lower budget. <laughs> you don't want to take another 10000 <laughs> <laughs> Well, this, got, this year was it because we got the ahead of the storm money too. We won't have spent all of that budget because we we get grant money done. Of the oh, current yeah. year budget, you mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. So you're going to underrun the current budget a little bit. Uh, let me see. So it says twenty five hundred. I think I saw. Yeah. For the for the um, ahead of the storm project. Yeah, we did get a grant for that. That was so kind of be, a grant. Which is good. Yeah. The clarity of the way you did this is nice. Ah, good. Very <laughs> easy to follow, and we're trying to perfect it each year. Very good. It's getting better each year. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Any uh, damage or, um, you know, with the trails and things that are going on? I know my daughter rides up there. That's why I'm asking. But Horse, yeah. I mean, horses do they there really hasn't the been um, they don't go on the bridges they don't go if on she the bridges she does she's not, not supposed, supposed to they're oh, not I, I her horses <laughs> they come in through other people's property and they don't go on the bridges and we right. are one of the ahead of the storm erosion projects was an area where horses came in by Meg Berlin's and that's all redone and there's a little path for them to go over instead of uh, in through a ditch, so I love seeing horses at the park. It's great. He loves it to go through Laura Max property up there. It's really quite nice. Mm -hmm. Oh, one other thing too, we did leave in the budget the the community event. Um, we did, haven't done it yet. Um, I don't know whether we'll do anything in the spring. We're talking about doing it in the fall and um, maybe combining it with um, a scavenger hunt that was done by the Shalott Land Trust that was really successful last spring. So, um, so we thought we would keep it in the budget for next year and actually be the 20th anniversary of the park. Uh, the park was created in the late 1990s and so there'd be good reason to celebrate. And hopefully we'll be able to do something next fall. Good. Appreciate this. We put this into the mix, and okay. uh, thank you for coming. And the preparation is just it's, it's good. Thank you. Thank you.
What's the date? Date 13. Okay, next item. Oh, the potential allocations or articles for town meeting. So that's in Dean's note. Um, we had an email today that came to everybody, right, that said conservation <coughs> right. fund is not requesting any money, so that would go to zero. So trails requested the thirty thousand when they were here last discussion, right? Right. And then recreation capital fund, they requested the fifty thousand. As far as the roof goes, I don't know how aggressive we need to be for budgeting for that, whether it's twenty five or fifty. Um, it's kind of just a roll of the dice. Now, last year we rolled it into the budget, twenty-five, right? Yeah. As a halfway, we thought it would cost fifty thousand, two year. Yeah, I mean, right now it's not leaking. I mean, it's still asphalt shingles are supposed to bend and not snap. They snap, so. <laughs> I guess it's kind of a roll of the dice. I mean, I wouldn't go oh, sooner than later, but I mean, maybe another 25. another 25 or half it or something like that. I guess we haven't had a real estimate on whether we want to go asphalt or standing seam or um, what the idea, what the select board. Well, we might feel differently in January when it's. Yeah, I would get a big blow and we lose a bunch of whatever. shingles and it might become a very upfront issue. Somewhere around twenty. How long 000. is an old roof going to last? Tarps if I, are pretty if I could answer that question, you wouldn't see me sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> There's two other items that we're probably going to be hearing about, and that's the library expansion. That could be an article for a bond. Um, they haven't. They're going to see us when in December. December seventeenth is when they're on the agenda. December seventeenth. Or don't bond issues have to be articles? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think so. so. So that's TBD. And another item that's being discussed, and that's the that's our cost associated with. That's the parking for the town between the fire station and the children's center. Uh, working with the the landowner. In the Schlott Health Center, there's an opportunity to increase town parking in that 100 foot swath of land. So there's been discussions going on, but nothing has come of it. I mean, it's the sales of the cost Schlott. estimate. You must have a oh, cost estimate. Could be in the 50,000 range. That's just for the real estate, though. No, that's that's the a gravel road, I and mean, it's a ballpark for a gravel road. Junior had recommended if we're going to build the road, to first do it in gravel, let it sit for a year, and then if you see how much it's used, see whether it gets rutted um, or potholed, and then if you need to come back and pave it, you know, in the next couple of years, or you know, a couple of years later. Or if it's doing fine, leave it as a gravel road. So fifty thousand for the gravel and fifty thousand for the property. No, lane? no, no, no. What's the property? It's just estimate? an easement then, and the the easement would be free if we if we put in the road. So you take the reverse of that. Um, we buy the land for a dollar and still put it in. So I don't think. To wash. For the gravel, it's a wa for yeah. the gravel. You know, three years later, after it's compacted, we may want to we want may want to blacktop it, or we may reach out a little bit for where the parking portion that would be. Um, so let's see how it progresses. But I know that um, Dr. Reagan is progressing in her acquisition of land. We 
did we ask the Chittenden County to help us with a parking plan evaluation for the town or we did I mean if you I think we did we we talked about it. I think we talked about it I think what ended up happening is I, I got an estimate from Dwayne King and I think you felt that estimate was okay. was just too much money to spend and because we're, we're gonna spend we're gonna pay for I believe 10 20 percent of that and so I think you felt yeah it was expensive better spend on gravel so I don't still I don't, the potential to use the entire road right away too and you could either parallel parking or diagonal parking on one side and change the road alignment a little bit to increase parking all along the road. what ferry road you mean yeah I was somewhere recently I'd have to think about it that I saw almost what you were talking about I'll have to think about it. I was like um oh, this works so those are the things that we that we're going to be dealing with over the next 60 days as we develop the budget. I don't know of any others unless you guys do. Any other questions on that? Articles for town meeting? We're ahead of schedule, Peter. Is that okay? Are you expecting someone else? Yeah, actually, um, Marty and Charlie are both coming. I told them what we said and changed to eight, so I'd imagine they'd be here for the summer. So they are coming around eight. We could do a couple of other things probably here. Wait, did you Minutes talk for about? Sure. Uh, what did I miss? The the eight o'clock item is what I'm referring to for Peter. Um. Oh, we can. Did we talk about the uh, improvement and repair? But then here's fire and rescue, senior center parking. You talked about the library addition. Will it be select board updates? We'll have some of that. Um, so, yeah. the performance reviews. How did, how did you do? Not yet. Um, we've had a hard time connecting because of her afternoon schedule and my afternoon schedule, so we're going to have to schedule a lunchtime review. Um, so I that's with you, and then the board has the option if they want to. Should we set a date for the overall reviews, and then that'll sure help you? Yeah, speed it up. Um, Was speed. it a deadline as a timeline? So we have Aaron, <laughs> Daryl, Dean, like and Nicole. How much time would you like to be safe? Uh, a week would be good. Okay. So... Since we'd be meeting with employees, we've, what we've done in the past is like four o'clock in the afternoon, if something like that works. Is, is there a date in the Monday. next? Huh? On a Monday. On, can we do it on a non-select board Monday? Oh, that would be next week then. December 3rd? December 3rd, that's a non, sounds good to me. Is that good with you? It's a non-select board meeting. So why don't we say performance review discussions, December 3rd, it's four o'clock, what time? Not everybody in the sub board attends all these. You tend not to want to, but it's your That's choice. True. We'll warn it. We'll warn a meeting. What time do you get done? Uh, I wouldn't be able to get here for <coughs> probably five o'clock. That's better for me, after 4.30. Do you want to start, say, at five o'clock? Or is that, then that makes the employees stay later, how do mm. it's they can come in later. Yeah. What are you suggesting? They come in later in the morning. Oh, that day? That morning. Huh. I, don't, I don't know whether there's a child care issue or not, but um, one thing is the wastewater committee. Yeah, it's 5.30. We have a meeting scheduled at 5.30 that day. That same day? On Thursday, yeah. That's, I mean, you could meet here. Calendar says it's meeting. Hanukkah, if that's a difference. Huh? Yeah. Calendar says that's Hanukkah. That's what time it's oh. participating. Yeah, I, Peter wants to participate. Um, if it got done early, usually, uh, let's get a I could do late. Tuesdays. It's Tuesday work for any differently for anyone. Well, start time doesn't help you, right? 
too soon? You'd have to leave work early if we did it anything earlier. Uh, and we'd miss Frank. No, I can get here by Monday. I just had a doctor's appointment also, so after work. But I can get here by 4. No, I'm, I'm, you would like to be a part of the reviews? I don't mind being part of the reviews. I probably don't have to be. Uh, sure is there any? Are there any days, Frank, that you can do it before five? Or I mean, actually, I can do it before five, but I mean, but I'm going to get up into like between one and three. Right. Well, or if it's after five, but on a different day than Monday the third, that is that a problem with that? No. It's just a conflict between on the third with the wastewater committee. Do it on Tuesday. Oh, that's a conflict for you. I see. And, and Peter. And, well, Peter doesn't sit in our reviews, does he? Or he will for? Daryl and Aaron. Daryl and Aaron. Okay, you will. So um, Tuesday or? Tuesday is fine. The 4th? That would be the 4th of December? Sure. Sounds like we have to start at 5 o'clock, though, to get. They can, like, like you said, they can start an hour later. So 5 o'clock. Five o'clock on the fourth, December fourth. So we use so we usually do like twenty minutes a person kind of thing. Yeah. So we're talking about four people. Yeah. So it'll be an hour and a half time coming and going and yeah. that's good for everybody. Depends, yeah. Starts at five. Starting at five? Yes. Okay. Why don't we do uh, Daryl and Aaron first, and then you'd be done. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. And then hopefully Nicole can make it in, and then Dean. So that would work out. Okay, December 4th, 5 o'clock. Okay, I'm moving on to select board updates. I think we've covered a lot of these things, haven't we? Um, I do have something for the, the trail easement. There's a property owner who is interested in conveying a trail easement on off of Greenbush Road. This is the segment of the um, Town Link Trail from north from cohousing coming north to the village, and um, they have indicated to the Trails Committee they're interested in donating an easement. I we have kind of a boilerplate easement document, but I wanted to just get select board's approval to have the town attorney review it and do the land, you know, check the land records just to make sure that it's, you know, clean and everything would be correct. I missed your opening. Is it parallel to the, to Greenbush or? It's parallel to Greenbush. Right? Parallel to Greenbush. Right. But set back a bit. It's so it's back where co-housing comes out into the parking lot. It would be going north from there. That's something trails would like. Yes. This is being offered. Yeah. So um, is that something that we could see drawn up before we end up spending money pursuing it? Yeah. Um, It'd be nice just to it see what it looks right. like and how it right. plugs into the, the rest of the, the larger easement. vision of sure. the trail network. Yeah. I totally agree. So do you want to have that? See how many other parcels of land are between that and another easement we might have? Me and me. <laughs> how far off the road and just where it is. You want to put it on the agenda for um, the 26th or is that? Um, yeah, I'll look at that. To, I'll try to get that on, fit that okay. in there. That's good input. Um, anything new on the crosswalk? The uh, Regional Planning Commission did come to look at it. Um, it's a, an engineer from Regional Planning. Um, he said he would be able to issue a recommendation by the end of the month. Cool. Oh, really? That'd be nice. Any joint discussion with File Ridge and the school administration or at all? Or? I haven't been involved in any. I mean, there might be some, but I haven't been part of but it. But that'll come to the town since it's a town road and. Right. Okay. So that'll be the end of the month we're in, November? Right. What? on it. And that's from who? Uh, Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission. So 
Somebody drove off into the... They were, they were in here, I thought. Huh. Are there any other updates? What's happening? Somebody driving in? Somebody's stuck out here in the, making a mess out of our lawn. The wet one? Yeah. <laughs> it's been drained. <laughs> That's oh, the well, swamp. There's a, there's a tow truck out there. Yeah, somebody's, I, when I was walking in, somebody was, mm -hmm. said, yeah, this lady's upset. She missed the driveway and drove into the lawn instead. Hope we got her license plate. Do you want to do uh, minutes, October 22nd? Okay, anything, anything else on updates? No. I could have a question maybe. Yeah. Is senior center parking the same <coughs> as the yes. parking on the budget? Yes. Um, we kind of realize the senior center is out of parking space, but then as we look at what we're talking about between the fire station and the children's center, it's really applicable to the town you know, Halloween and the 4th of July, different things we do, it would really become town parking. So rather than just label it senior center parking, it's, to my view, it's kind of supports the town overall. So we're looking at that narrow lot between the driveway on the east side of the firehouse and the senior center? Right, I would say it's narrow, it's 100. The actual proper, it's, it's uh, Mason property and that's the access to the property behind all of that, and I believe it's 100 feet wide. So that, where is the proposed uh, health center going to be? Behind the children's center? Behind the children's center is an acre that they're in, in discussions or negotiations <clears throat> on. I guess I'd ask, is there information the select board wants to help um, make a decision about whether to fund that in the coming year is there well don't we need to see what's the term you call it some kind of a layout what, what's the a site plan site plan is that when will that be available um, it's not in the works if that's something that you want that would be we'd have to would that come out of the the planning that the Charlotte Health Center is doing they are Yes, they're going to, um, they're, they're scheduled to do sketch plan review for the subdivision in January. And after that, they would have another application for the final subdivision hearing, which, which would show a road. So that would probably be in the range of February or March. The site plan. Um, this site plan would be part of the subdivision. So if we're going to put any money in, we'd need to know first week at the latest, first or second week of January. Which I think it's not going to be ready for that. So then we'd have to procure a drawing ourselves if we wanted to have a map presentable at town meeting. And what did you say the cost of that is? A couple thousand? Um, I imagine it probably is, yeah. And I mean, there were. There are pieces of it, actually, uh, one piece of it has been done. Um, the property owner has obtained a wetlands evaluation, which um, is preliminary because the state only allows, will, will approve a delineation between May 9th and October 30, or May 1st and October 31st. So this evaluation was done after that, so the state won't sign off on it, but he did do an evaluation of wetlands and it does show that there is um, basically upland or dry land in that corridor that, you're, that would allow for a road to go to the back and an area to be built for the health center. Wide so, enough for road and park? Uh, it looks to be yes. So where did you see that? It just came in, the e in an email today I, I forwarded it to you just before the meeting so from that we would do what you call the sketch plan then uh, the applicant does the sketch plan so would I'm trying to get so they they private. won't get finalized until next summer because they <clears throat> can't get a wetland determination right but if we want to put what do we need to put something in the budget that we the select board could feel confident we have something or vote for or against 
mean, we would, we, what, what do we need to have a, a diagram of some sort of where You feel it's you need be. a plan, a site plan, yeah, to, a site to see plan. actually where it would go and what the width would be and what the depth would be and. And who would do that, an engineer? Yes. So we could do that. Are we encroaching on the private property owners by doing that? No. Is it complementary to the work they want to get done? Yes. I wonder if they'd split the cost with us if we went ahead to do this part of it. Is that, is that, or is it such a small amount of money yet? Uh, no, I'm sure. I, I, I would think it would be advantageous to, to look at that whole plan as one piece, which is the, the subdivision that's coming before the planning commission, the parking area, and the road. But they're not going to be, we need to be done. We want to put something in the budget. Yeah. We need to have it done in the next 60 days kind of thing. But we don't want to do their whole property. No. No, and it can't be done in 60 days. They can. So we could do that. It goes back 500 feet, right? Right. 100 feet wide, 500 feet back. And what you say, it's a couple thousand dollars? To I'm, I'm guessing. I mean, I, I haven't been um, on the customer side of, of getting that service, so I, I, would, I can get a quote and, uh, and find out. Is, are we okay with that? Quotes. Huh? Would you have to get I, three I think quotes? that's a little more than we'd need. I mean, just a blown up view of the Google Maps with an outline. I mean, you're, you're talking budget money for a foot of a foot of base and eight inches of gravel topping or something like that get us yes. all you'd need is a, a showing the road and the parking so you can get a ballpark square footage and junior can tell us what he charges that would give Perfect. us a budget number instead yeah. of spending a couple sense. of grand so yeah. we just we'll blow up a google map and draw a line on it and, and have, have junior give us an estimate and then we can talk about it yeah i mean you're Gravel road's a pretty For basic sure. thing. I mean, and you have the width of the parking area as well as the width of the maybe the roadway is 25 feet, maybe the parking is another 25. You still have 50 feet left over for whatever yeah. they want to do shrubs or. And even if they wanted us to move it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you're just looking the the bulk of the money is the volume, the square footage of the road work, whether it moves right or left or north or south, it doesn't matter. It's still the same. Okay. So, how do we quote for construction and, and a, yeah. a sketch rather than an actual site plan? Do we want to? Yeah. Because that's something you can lay out from a Google's map and. Oh, you, can I can get the lister to? She's pretty good at doing that. the. Uh, okay. <coughs> current use maps. Okay. We'll have her dial one up for. Oh. Oh. For this. Right. She's not here, so. Right. <laughs> Would be on the side of the proposed road that would go back to the south. Probably side. just the first part. The just first, the first. That's what I meant was not that the town should absorb the whole project, but just I think from a sense of looking at the entire parcel, it would be good if they were done in close. He's, I think Ben asked that we, if we're, he give us a, a, a right for. A, for a dollar for the easement, and we put 500 feet of a 20. How big would our access be? 25 feet, or it probably would be 25 20, 20, 24 feet. 25 or 28, and then since it's 100 feet wide, there would be plenty of space on the fire station side of that easement. You could almost have phase one, phase two, or parking because it goes even beyond the blacktop of the, of the uh, fire station to the north. So we run alongside of the station and then yeah. into the... Yeah, maybe an angle, there's, there's room to would turn be, around. Would there be an access from the parking lot, uh, uh, like a, almost like a driveway access? From the... From the parking. To what, the senior center behind the... Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, we, that, I mean, that's... You did lose a couple of parking spots that way. You just have then you're going to gain. Pedestrian accent, access where they cross that grass. Mm -hmm. so there's a septic tank and a couple of things over there. I just there didn't know if that would have to be something that would have to be listed on their proposal, too. Because it would create a new access onto that. 
I don't think that would necessarily be a good idea. No, I think that complicates things. So you could come up with the next, is that all right to put on the next? Yeah, agenda? I will ask um, Junior, any other contractors that sure. you want me to, I can ask. Sure. Okay. Sorry? Oh. more permit. Yeah. State. Because it'll be all one common plan of development. So it'll be a fairly involved process. I think that would be up to Ben, up to the uh, the landowner to get that permit as part of the subdivision. What about, but you'll have some, you'll have stormwater work in the road and all that too. Right. So. The, the, the road is part of the subdivision. Do we have to put a culvert under it, probably? I don't think there's a ditch there. I don't think there's a roadside ditch. It won't be that culvert. It'll be the management of what to do with the water right. in a storm event. So, just to clarify, so the road is, will be part of the subdivision, but I'm wondering about the park, parking will not be. The parking is not, right. So, I think to Charlie's point, it's like there's a section of runoff that I don't, I wouldn't, I don't know how that would be handled in terms of <coughs> responsibility, right? Because it's really not part of that subdivision, and it's not, it's not part of it. Anyway, right, the parking is... Just being paved over. Or gravel. Or, or, or gravel. Gravel and pavement is the same, but uh, the state will consider it one common right. plan of development. If it, I mean, if it happens, at, at this point, the subdivision is proposing the road, the, the town is budgeting, or may budget, put it in the budget for... Um, construction of the road. I guess that we haven't talked about construction of the parking area. It just is allowed and allowed by by doing the road. It gives the town the right to do parking. Right, but the stormwater permit does is for all the impervious well, they will land on that on the, that particular lot. So it's got to be for they won't all be needing the road until they have the permit. Right, which they're... So we wouldn't be proceeding until after their permits handled. Well, we're anyway. talking May, June of next year, the start least, of our fiscal year. By the time year. you get to the ANR right, permit. Right, but I think Charlie's, I think, Charlie's, I think what Charlie's getting at is you'd have to, if, if, if it went through, the development went through the Planning Commission and went in with the road, if the town wanted to have parking, they would have to update their, their permit. You'll have, to, you'll have to get a stormwater permit on top of it there to do the parking, and there'll be, there'll be more infrastructure than just the cost of the road, or just the cost of parking, that's all. Not to make it complicated, but we're here in Vermont, and it's complicated. But all, all the more reason to try to coordinate the two together is exactly. somehow possible. Well, I, I, would, I would think that the, they're going to get through planning commission. Oh, no. What's your process for this? for what the uh, Children's Center, not the, children, the Health Center. Center wants to do. Well, that's, I mean, what I was well, wondering about is, is if, that, if that parking, if that proposed parking is connected to the Senior Center, then the they, senior would, they Center. would come in with a, for a permit to expand right. parking. The Senior Center would. I mean, the Senior Center is on town land, right? So this is the Well, we're calling it town parking. Yeah. The town would. But so if the question question is the health center wants to proceed mm -hmm. they're going to fill out the necessary applications how long does it take after you see it that they would get the necessary permits is it six months or well after they we have sketch and then we have a hearing and then we have 45 days to issue a decision and after the 45 days they would have up to 120 days to act on it so oh, next, yeah. if they want to have construction so next in January, <coughs> so if it takes their sketch and then there's a hearing, <coughs> so I would say probably in the spring you would issue a decision, April maybe. That would be subject to A and R approval. Or do they have to have that before they you issue it through a wetland? Or buy it, they need a permit, a wetland permit. You, well, you said that there yeah. was an area where they. I th it looks like there's an area that can do it that doesn't affect the wetland or the buffer. So if it doesn't affect the wetland, then... Okay. They could move this one acre, probably. Yeah. So I would think the parking and the access would be shown on their, should be shown on their site plan. So the square footage... I mean, I think it would be advantageous, even though technically it's not 
they're not applying for parking, they're applying for the road. But it would be advantageous, I think, if it was on there because we could look at it in total. So for us to have a concept of <coughs> this Google Map view, what it would cost for a 500 foot long, 20, whatever you said, five feet wide parking, we still get that estimate. It's valid for us for the purposes of budgeting yeah. and this group to vote. And then as the permits come along, if it's everything's approved, then we'd have the money to support the piece that interests us. Okay. Is the permit uh, the cost? I'm just wondering what the cost of the permit is for the wetlands permit or whatever it is there. The stormwater permit, if there's a difference in, if, if it covers by square footage or if it's... It's a square foot price. So that would be an increase in their permit price if they put it on their plan, the parking on their plan. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You pay by the square foot of the permit. It's anything over an acre or I mean, it starts to get tri gets triggered once you're over an acre, is that yeah. correct? Of impervious, which building, parking, road, it'll be over an acre. Hmm. I'm just figuring out what the, what the, basically what the town's, <coughs> you know, amount would be if they added it to their application and the town were to pick up the difference in order to get the parking on their permit. Prorated by the number of square feet for the parking? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm trying, trying to separate numbers. Okay. So if we have the first step for us and we know that the health center is proceeding with their work and to answer your question, perhaps they would start, I think, next summer if things go well. Summer of 2019? Yeah. I think so. So we'd have to go through. In our budget, that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay. Quickly. I'm going backwards to the. Quickly. Eight o'clock item. A discussion of permit appeal process with planning commission. Yeah. So thank you for. Okay. <laughs> Bring me up to speed on. Yeah. So I think what's this, happening here? It's really. This was a discussion amongst the planning commission that came up after, as a result of, of the Krasnow appeal. So um, I think there's a couple of things. I think very simply put, it's, I think we're not really sure of what kind of a procedure there is. I think primarily when things are remanded back to the town and the town tries to come to an agreement with the with the landowner as opposed to if it go, ends up going to court, then it's pretty straightforward. But I think um, in this case, I know there was a lot of, my understanding is, is again, I have accused myself from this subdivision because I'm the butter, but the, there was a lot, I think, my understanding is there was a lot of discussion with the Krasnows to try to work things out to keep it out of the court. Um, with the board, I mean, With the board, yeah. yes. Which is a good idea, and I think the question is to what. I think it's the, the planning commission's opinion. I speak for the planning commission here that in a case like that, it seems to make sense that that it would be important to have some representation of the planning commission, so that you're you're kind of getting input from from both the planning commission that made the decision and from the landowner. I think that's. Kind of simply put. I think what happened here, or what what should happen in the future, is that when somebody files a suit and you know there's going to be a lawsuit, you should proceed post haste to brief people in the select board because instead of waiting to be asked to participate, because it's it's going to have part of any time there's a to the best of my knowledge, when somebody files the lawsuit. The first step is they, the judge says, try to mediate. So that's when the information is needed as the first step of the lawsuit. So if they filed one, it's going to proceed on the court's timeline. Right. 
So it's best, in my opinion, to prevent this happening again. As, as soon as you find out that somebody has filed the suit, have, have the communication, a meeting with the select board or whoever they, in this case, chose Frank and I to, to do this to get us up to speed so we know all the information, have all the discussion from both sides. And so I think that's fine. We could do that, which is, I mean, Daryl's probably going to be the first one that would hear if somebody's appealing it, like uh, at Cavera. In the end, they didn't. But, uh, and then an initial discussion, I guess we would put it on the agenda or something. We would have an initial discussion. And I think then once... These were, they were on our for this particular example. Pardon? We had them on the agenda, I believe. There were updates, isn't that right? Well, they, sh they showed up as a, f as a function of the court schedule. <coughs> they said, you know, do you want to make an appearance? Yes. And then the appeal was made, and then the... <coughs> and so when they, when they, when the court <coughs> remands it back to the town, right, then, then you, you select a couple of members that are going to participate in the, in the, in the remanding of the case, right? When like it's in this case, it was you and... When it's uh, it previously, when it was a zoning issue, the, the cat's place, the mediation, the, the, the official court mediation occurs when each side pays for a mediator and pays for their attorneys and they don't sit down and talk. The attorney, you pay the attorneys by the hour to run back and forth. And this one, the Krasnos proposed that we skip the attorney, the, the mediators and all the other thing and just go at it, which is, if it's not a hostile situation where you can sit across from the person, it's great. Sometimes it's, it's you know, they view it as, as, as hostile and they don't want the two parties to actually talk to each other because they get mad and throw shoes or whatever people do. So <clears throat> the Krasnovs proposed to the select board that, you know, let's skip the, the court costs here and, and talk, so we did. But those, that was in line with the court dates. So, I mean, there was a timeline there that was created by, not us, created by the court. The court, they had to make a couple of extensions even to the process it was. Is there any, I mean, was there been any settlement before we go to the next step? And at one point we did talk to Marty and Charlie. I but, thought there was that discussion through the process of mediation with planning commission members. Well, there was, but I think, um, well, we sat down once. We sat down once, and it was very late in the game. And so after having gone through this experience, I feel personally that it would be, it wasn't a great procedure, um, and that it compromises potentially the way the town does town plan reviews and decisions. And so it made me want to ask a few questions about is this the scenario, is this the procedure that we want to have as a town to uphold what we're all trying to uphold <laughs> in our documents? And I did not get the sense that it was it was um, a high quality way of doing things in terms of setting precedence and want to get too into the detail on this, but I just felt like it really warrants um, a process that's clear um, and on, on paper and it's right. more not, not understandable. All, not all towns have that. Uh, I think we had Dean look into the process um, and I think it was, wasn't it, when you looked into it, I think there were, there were towns that I think we asked the lawyer and I think there were towns that do have planning commission members or board members be active during the whole thing some at the beginning and some at the end there was so 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 there was no so, so there was no real standard this was a, standard a very big fight um, so for two individuals on a select board who never went to one meeting for, for those two years, that, that's a lot of body of knowledge to, uh, to understand the depth of what the Planning Commission used to make the decision. So I, I'm totally not convinced 
that the select board had the capacity to do the job. You know, if, you're, if your ultimate town goal is to uphold the town plan, which is, which is what it is, um, I'm not convinced that that way of doing business got us there. I don't even know what the decision was. And I'm a planning commission member. It's not on any document, it's not on any, it's not, it hasn't been shared. We still don't know. Um, so it's just sort of raises a lot of questions in terms of procedure and process and fairness and justice and all that stuff. Well, that's, that's what mediation is. I mean, the fail-safe way is to say that whenever somebody files a lawsuit, <coughs> start ahead saying, we're not gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna budge on mediation. We're giving in, it's gonna go to court and the court will decide it. Then it's the same process every time. We just know where it's gonna end. The judge will say, you know, you gotta try to mediate and we'll sit down and we'll say, we can't accept anything you say, it's over with. I don't, I don't think that's what Marty's trying to say. I think what Austin was trying to say is there was a lot of history and information that we had over the period of time when we negotiated back and forth with Craftsman. You guys weren't, you didn't have the benefit of that knowledge. So you're, you're, sort, of, you're sort of negotiating the, the deal with them after the fact, not really having been through the first half of it. So what's the point of us doing all the work we did to start with if you guys are going to then just do a different deal later on? That, that, that's sort of that's yeah. essentially what what, exactly. what the question was we had was since since however whatever the mechanism is that somebody from planning commission can participate in that in the future would be helpful I just think so that you guys have, have the information from our perspective of, of why we made decisions we made right but it wasn't a total rewrite I mean the way you're per portraying this picture is that we rewrote your whole decision no I don't think that's what <laughs> that's it, what we it said. got that's down what to a, a hundred feet of, of what was called forest, which was an open field. It, it always gets down to something at the end. Right. That's a little point, right? But there's a whole lot of stuff that gets you to that point. And so, you know, not, not being, and we went back and forth with them a number of times getting yeah. to what those last details were. And, and there were people dug in their heels over different pieces of what they thought was important and what was important for their decision or what somebody else thought was important for their development. And that's what you got down to is the final piece. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's all that history of getting to that point, which is sort of, which is important that you don't necessarily have when you're at the mediation stage, if you haven't been involved. So if, if going back to what you were saying, Fritz, you were saying that often, sometimes it gets remediated back and sometimes there's, a, there's an umpire, there's a, there's a lawyer who kind of refs the mediation. Well, that's the... Right? That was the, the court appointed mediation right. process. And in this case, the town, the, the town decided let's try it without, which I mean, that, that makes sense. It just seems that in either case, whether there's a, a mediator or not, that it would be good <coughs> that if there is going to be discussion within this case, the Krasnos, that I think it makes sense to have the planning commission. My, my point is that there is always going to be the discussion. So don't, let's not wait till. The, the, the judge is saying, this is your deadline. Have you come to any agreement yet? You have to assume that there's going to, as soon as there's the filing of a lawsuit, let's assume this process starts. Mm -hmm. Then you start schooling the select board on all of the stuff that's happened so far. So I, I think there was a staff disconnect on that mm -hmm. as far as um, reaching out to the planning commission and not knowing really if there was identified people on the planning commission that were meant to be brought into the process. I think that's the biggest flaw in our, in the, for our lack of process is that you were waiting for us to ask you and we were figuring that if there was something you'd tell us. Well, yeah, actually, my, my expression was that I, I, thought I, I thought I got from Dean, but maybe I'm mistaken, that because I had asked Charlie and Marty to represent the planning commission. So somehow there was yeah. a miscommunication well, that's or whatever. A good but so I'm that wondering, no in, are, are you in, are, are you saying that you think in an ideal world, what would have happened is <clears throat> we would have had discussions with the, with the select board, giving you the detail behind the decision much earlier, and then you would meet with the the applicant without the planning commission, or you would. So I think the different there's a little bit of a difference there if. if we give you kind of regurgitate, what? and then there's still a little discussion with the 
the applicant, but there's no representation from the planning commission. Because I, I think it's hard to know what, the, I think to Charlie's point as to where the... So the fix to me should be, you have two parties. You have Krasner and you have planning commission. If we're mediating, if we're the mediators in a friendly atmosphere, which it was, we should have been working with planning and Krasna and the applicant because we took on your role as both mediator and representation of planning. And I understand what you're saying. I think if we had a procedure, because generally when there's these issues come up, every time my years here on the board, we've always supported planning. We just, you know, we send our person to, to hear the judge whenever we support planning. And here's a little different situation because it was a, it was a friendly discussion. I think our, if we put a procedure together, my sense is you should be a part of that team and we're kind of the neutral party. We're representing the town, but it's better than not having you here at all, right? So then Krasnos has their case, playing has their case, and if, you, if the parties allow the select board to have a mediation capacity, we do the back and forth, but within the walls of not having lawyers and all that stuff. I agree with that. And so I, I think that's a mistake we made. I don't I see that space. being the legal structure in the state, though. Okay. The legal structure in the state is really clear that the judge is going to decide when a landowner appeals a town's decision. Right. The first crack at that decision is in the planning or the zoning. Then the second crack, the judge remains to the select board. Not to mediate between two parties, but to be the party, be the to mediate with the landowner. If that can't happen, then the judge will decide, is the third step of the legal process. But we're we're not, skipping that two years of knowledge that they have. No, added. not skipping. It's just the judge, the state, is saying that it's the select board's responsibility on behalf of the town to make the decision. How the select board is educated, I think, was the big piece that was missing. Right, okay. So, but as far as framing it as a mediation between a planning commission and a landowner is not accurate legally. Okay. That's not what's happening. But I, but I also don't think the Vermont statute precludes a planning commission members from participating in that process. I don't think so either. And I think participation it is important. It does not preclude. Therefore, you can be a part. The select board is going to make a decision about it, yeah. but it doesn't, but that the planning commission can participate in the conversations getting there. And I, I agree it's important to. I just wouldn't frame it that it's a mediation between the two parties. And the way the law, as we were reminded from Stitzel, Stitzel guys, was that a select board has the authority to make a decision based upon anything they want it to be. It can be whatever they want. That's why I want to be at this meeting tonight, is that while the statute does say that, I don't think it's a good idea for our town. It should be a very last-ditch uh, way to do business because it makes a mockery out of the two-year process we just went through. Right. Well, that, like, to me, is incredibly unsavory, and I think we should be standing up strong and clear to be promoted that we do not do that unless there's some kind of wicked crisis. You know, like... Whoa, well, well, you know. Frank said, is that what you think happened? Yeah. yeah, I think that's what happened. I think that the, the decision, and I don't honestly know because I don't even know what the decision is, <laughs> but I'm going to suspect that what, what got resolved was that, what got concluded was that it, it got changed. The decision was changed to uh, um, appeal to the desires of the applicants, and it went against what the Planning Commission decision was. So I would say that 90% of the Planning Commission decision was upheld, and Marty, maybe you don't know that, and maybe we should meet and talk yeah, about it. I mean, that would be useful. Because it so sounds like you're criticizing the process that you actually don't know what the outcome was. I said that I didn't know what the outcome was, but I am suspecting, and I would like to know, thank you, um, what exactly the decision was, because I'm very nervous that the town is going down a path that's actually creating precedents that we don't want to have. And How come we, you don't know already? What? How come you it's don't no know by it's, now? It's part of... It's, 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 uh, like, you don't know, Charlie. You guys don't know. I don't think you've been provided with the documentation. Did you ask? That was like did, a did month ago. Did you ask ago. for it? Dean, ha um, Dean has that. That's why we're here tonight, Carol. Oh. No, I, I, I'm... I would think you'd have it. 
I think it was sent out. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a difficult... There's a letter that was it, sent, but it doesn't tell you anything. It, doesn't yeah, it, it refers back to the decision as far as which findings and which conditions. Uh, and I thought so, yeah, it, 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 yeah, it's like a summary, it's like the Rolodex yeah. card. So you have to go back and forth between no, the two documents. Like, yeah, not enough. There's not a final document that says these are all the findings, these are all the conditions. It basically says condition F was changed, condition Y was yeah. changed. But it doesn't tell you what it was changed no, to. Yeah, it does. Yes. It does. Yes. I have to go back and look. Yeah, I might have missed it, but it didn't. Right, see. there was only there was only a, a one condition, I think one condition that was two that I'm aware of. Two two that were changed, yeah. and they were. So the, the rest of the decision, which is uh, very detailed, is so was it, is, it was uh, was upheld. Okay, so it, when you made your change in the decision and whatever it was, did you justify that in, docu in a documented way? Any way is it anywhere in our paperwork that explains your thinking and your justification for your change? I think the findings were changed to support the conditions. So you made new findings? Not is new, but edited. To one or two of the findings were changed, not new. Was findings. there was there some justification created or? established to warrant the change? I mean, this is what we have to think about in terms of the legal aspect of it all. Yeah, because we're, we're doing this yeah. very similar development yeah, straight across Malfilo Road from their property. And so, it, you know, it's sort of, we had some of the same concerns for that property as we did across the road. So as things change, it affects the decision you're making about somebody else yeah. developing another parcel. So it, it um, But this decision was done the court decision came down after our decision on the other property. So the other one could end up in court also for the same reasons. Possible. Uh, and anybody can it's, feel for any reason. It, yeah, it's not. I mean, they, 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 they decided not to appeal the decision. I, mean, I, think, I think, I think this, this decision this was a really big one. It was a lot of it. It was very complicated. It was three years, right? Two or three years worth of work. It was a long time, and it was a lot of work. But I think, too, I think things that I'm hearing is, A, that I appreciate what you said, Lane, which is it sounds like nine times out of ten you uphold whatever the planning commission has decided. I think Marty's point about having some kind of documentation when there is a change, like in this case it sounds like there were very small change, or two changes, um, that's very similar to what we do with the Planning Commission is we, you know, we have to basically justify why we come up with a decision or requirements of that decision and that we would expect that the same thing would hold true. You know, if the select board decides to alter something that there would be there be, there's got to be some reason for it that's going to right. substantiate I mean, that that change. And 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 you're going to ask the court that when they make the decision, when they decide that they're going to do the same thing, they're going to come down with a decision, and you're going to question the judge saying why. Well, the judges they make a decision if the if the district court makes a decision. They're going to have justification in their in their decision. That's their job. If they're a good judge, <laughs> which we, we have worked to do in that area, we saw that in the the silo, the um, solar panel issue of a Mount Philo. We saw that you know went to court and took them ninety days to come out, but there was really justification. To your point, the judge. Environmental court. That was a multi-page document of. So, is there a is there a, a simpler solution to say? I mean, I'm not I'm not opposed to having the planning commission be a part of. That's things. what I'm about to say. Is there a simple solution saying that? Sorry, guys. We should have called you in when it came in our hands, and and reviewed the steps that are, as a mediation group, kind of worked with you to let you know what we were thinking and push back with us a bit, I mean, to be a part of the process. Yeah, and I think, I, I think, I think Fritz has a good idea, which is, 
when we know a decision has been appealed that we should set up that discussion. Yeah. Ideally, I would think the discussion would happen close to when there's going to be discussion with the applicant. And that, First person you know, who learned this is going to be probably Dean or Daryl. Daryl, yeah, probably Dean or Daryl. Yeah. So they yeah. can, at that time, notify the select board and the planning commission right. this has been appealed. When do you guys want to meet to see? But tip, we would want to know, in other well, words, the way I understand it is an applicant can appeal and they can send, a lawyer can send a letter that's saying we're appealing. And they have a certain amount of time by which they have to substantiate why they're appealing. So that's when we would want to talk is after we know exactly what they're the ground, appealing. The right, grounds, what they're right. Doing. Like with the last one that, that they didn't go to court, they, they, they withdrew. That's right. Um, we, as a board, instructed the lawyer to send a letter to make an appearance. And we did that before the, we had the questions of, or reasons why they were appealing. So I would assume that probably once the select board decides they're going to make an appearance, to have the lawyer say we're going to make an appearance, that we get together with the planning commission to know, or the zoning board, whichever one it is, to figure out exactly what's going on. I think the sooner the better to, I mean, this one, like Charlie said, this was two years for the stuff. I mean, we're not going to get educated in a 10 minute meeting. I mean, I would start sooner than later. True. I think this, this is a little bit, this is unique, but yeah, I think, and generally I think earlier is better, but I think we want to know what the, what the grounds are. Otherwise it's really, it's hard, hard to, do other than just give you a history of it, as opposed to knowing what the grounds are for the uh, for the appeal. Right. I mean, if you if so you to focus on what needs to be looked at. I think if you think we need a procedure, that we can do that, or how you can help with, us. How do you do it with zoning now? Is there? A, is That's the, the you don't know, right now. It's the, I've never seen any. I mean, a lot of times the chairman will try to try to uh, look into it, but most of the time it's just as the select board that handles all the mediations. And the zoning board doesn't rep have any representation or involvement? I, there hasn't been an appeal never, in quite never. a while. We haven't well, had they, an appeal for quite a while. That one about the cats was the last one. Actually cats. Right, and, and that one didn't, uh, and that one uh, wasn't Trying to remember if that wasn't, was wasn't represented by the zoning board at the time. Was that a zoning board appeal or? Uh, yeah. I think that was conditional. No, use. no, that was a that was a violation. Notice violation. Oh, okay. Oh, Families right. living in. So the, it was an appeal. The zoning board. It was an appeal. Of the zoning administrator's decision to the zoning board, and the zoning board upheld the zoning administrator's decision. So our decision was appealed. Right. And. Um, there was no representation from the zoning board during that during that uh, court case or that mediation which again wouldn't about probably wouldn't have been a bad idea I mean that was simple because it was just an appeal of the zoning ministry decision but it was nowhere near as complex as your planning commission so I think it's incumbent upon us to invite you, as Fritz said, as soon as we hear there's been an appeal. Um, I think it just means working better together. I'm not sure we need a procedure, but then it depends I on think that the is complexity the of it. Huh? That is the procedure. That's a study. Yeah. 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 As soon as it's filed. Don't say policy. Ugh. But I would think you would know by <laughs> now the what the what the mediation, what the turnout was. I can't believe you don't know. We have the, we have the, the dis we have the legal document that says Dean sent it out on 1027, I think, and it was it says what it is. It tells you to change this sentence to this and that sentence to that. You go back and pick it up, and you don't you don't there's no supporting documentation of the thought process about how come it got to that. That's the that's the piece Marty's curious about. Piece. It's not it's not Otherwise, just why would anybody care? about a planning commission decision. They can just go mediate and pay no dollars and get the decision that may be closer to what they want. It's a way of gaming the system. That's what I call it, gaming the system. That's what happened. 
I mean, really that law is set up to if the town is dead broke, they can't afford, you know, there's reasons for having that statute, but to use a planning commission, then all of a sudden use a select board. Well, they did the same thing with affectionately cats. It's because just, affectionately it, it's cats, interesting to me in Vermont that we do this. Affectionately cats is a, was, was a accessory apartment. Yeah. And they're using it as a duplex and it's not allowed to be a duplex. And the decision was to allow it to be a duplex for a certain period of time which is in direct violation of our zoning bylaws. So that was a verbal agreement. So that was a verbal agreement from a previous zoning administrator that, you know, that was done. And then it was a, through mediation was approved by the select board to let it remain a duplex in violation of our zoning bylaws. Until it's sold, right? Until it's sold. In so anticipation of changing the bylaws that next year, which ended up possibly not getting on the ballot. Not happen, that's right. Yeah, I remember we discussed that. So it was just a So it's not just the planning commission. <laughs> it is the it's zoning. just it's an interesting situation mm -hmm. um, that and I, I feel like we could do better than that, even though the statute says X. Okay. Right. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. We're going to communicate better. Thank you. There won't be another one in 10 years, but no. Yeah, hopefully we have that. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about the different people playing. Yeah, yeah. This case for... The new one or the old one? No, the Krasnow for yeah. things like that. That was the longest I've been involved in. And I believe there were three site visits. Uh, and we had meetings above and beyond regularly scheduled meetings strictly for discussion and deliberation. This is not something that we did on a whim. A lot of volunteer hours. <laughs> a lot we'll of have hours. It turn out a like lot this. of hours and a lot of time went into it and a lot of thought. Well, I understand your yeah. Thank you. frustration on us. Thank you, thank you. We didn't spend any legal fees, though. Thank you. Or minimal legal fees. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. 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 Thank you for thank your time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We're on to the minutes of October 22nd, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, huh? <laughs> well, we're Motion approved the minutes of October 22nd as may be amended. Second. I have to say that our... Um, Minute taker Kate Kelly really sat here and just captured everything. A lot of detail in here. I didn't say anything wrong. She was good. She was good. She's the one style who's... is to do it real time. You're just sitting here. I guess she likes the time. She's just like a court reporter. And I think she was done when we were done, <laughs> other than proofing it or something. There's a different way. There's a lot of a lot of information here. She's uh, working for Lewis Creek Association. I might forget if she works for. I think she just took the job from uh, Krista Hoff. Just left. Oh, okay. So if nobody has anything on it, because I, I didn't. I didn't either. All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Is there anything else to be brought before the board? Be the motion to adjourn. And warrants to be signed, uh, a warrant to be signed. Is adjournment been seconded? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Don't you look